The anime begins in a city under attack by planes and a girl desperately running for shelter with her mother. Suddenly, the mother disappears in a fiery blaze, leaving the kid in tears. Just when you thought things couldn't get more heated, a flaming tornado whisks the girl away like she's auditioning for a fireworks show. Fast forward to present day Tokyo. Meet Satoru Mikami, a 37-year-old bachelor who's waited so long for love that even his microwave has given up on him. He's got a decent life, but there's one thing missing, a girlfriend. Not having one doesn't really bother him though. As Satoru strolls down the street, lost in thought about his loveless life, his buddy Tamura pops up, eager to introduce Satoru to his new flame. Enter Miho, Tamura's girlfriend. She's seen Satoru around before but never talked to him until now. Satoru, being the hilarious guy he is, decides to mess with Miho by claiming he knows all about her celebrity status due to some juicy rumors. Miho's face turns as red as a tomato on a hot summer's day, but don't worry, Tamura reassures her that Satoru's just cracking jokes. As they head out for a meal at Satoru's favorite restaurant, they suddenly hear a commotion. A wild man wielding a dagger appears out of nowhere and charges at Tamura. Satoru, in a daring act of bravery, shoves Tamura aside and takes a dagger to the back. The attacker makes a run for it, leaving Satoru confused and in pain. Tamura calls for an ambulance, and Satoru's thinking, great, I finally get some action, and it's a dagger in the back. While bleeding and pondering his life choices, Satoru reaches out to Tamura with his blood-stained hand and delivers his last request, wipe the hard drive on his computer at home. Tamura, who wanted to impress Satoru with Miho, is now in tears, and Satoru, in his final moments, advises Tamura to take good care of her. He never imagined he'd die a virgin, but he's determined that if he's reborn, he'll be a real Casanova, making up for lost time. Satoru's life flashes before his eyes, and he thinks about how close he was to hitting that big Forminus Zero as a virgin. In his next life, he might even become a legendary sage. As Satoru closes his eyes and prepares to meet the great beyond, he gains consciousness once more, but things have taken a strange twist. Satoru awakens in a peculiar world as a slime. Yes, you read that right, a slime. He starts bouncing around, realizing that his slime body is pretty handy. He doesn't even need to eat or sleep. But something's up, he hasn't pooped yet. As he continues his slimy escapades, a mysterious voice informs him that all the stuff he's dissolving is stored in his unique stomach. He can analyze and acquire skills from the objects he ingests, and he even learns to make healing potions from the plants he dissolves. Handy, right? Satoru gets so excited that he gobbles up some fancy stones, but his slimy enthusiasm gets him into a lake. No worries, though, he absorbs the water and unlocks a new skill, water pressure propulsion. Now he's not just any slime, he's a high-speed, hydro-powered slime. As he zooms around, he smacks into an invisible wall, but no pain here, his regeneration skill has him covered. Then, he hears a mysterious voice again. This time, a weird creature offers him a deal, eyes in exchange for not being scared after seeing him and promising to visit later. Satoru agrees, and this strange dragon creature tells him how to unlock his secret skill of magic sense. Suddenly, Satoru sees everything, including the dragon, who introduces himself as Storm Dragon Veridora, one of only four true dragons in this world. Apparently, slimes with self-awareness are as rare as finding a unicorn in your backyard. Satoru spills the beans about his reincarnation tale to Veridora, who mentions that people usually arrive in this magical world as otherworlders, gaining special abilities in the process. As for Veridora, he was sealed because of a little mishap involving a town and a barbecue gone wrong. A hero with divine protection sealed him in this cave for three centuries. Satoru and Veridora become unlikely friends, and Satoru realizes that life has a funny way of surprising you, even if it involves becoming a slime in a magical world. Meanwhile, Tamura faithfully wipes the data on Satoru's computer as instructed, unknowingly contributing to the weirdest adventure ever. Satoru's heart goes out to the poor dragon, stuck in that cave for a staggering 300 years. The dragon desperately asks Satoru if there's any way to get him out before his magic runs out. It turns out, the dragon is like a leaky balloon, slowly losing its magicules. No wonder the cave is chock full of magical herbs and ores, it's like a mystical Costco in there. Satoru tries his predator skill to absorb the imprisonment spell, but alas, no luck. The voice in Satoru's head suggests that if he analyzes the unlimited imprisonment from both inside and out, he might crack the code. The catch? The dragon's skills are locked up tighter than a bank vault. But Satoru has an idea, what if the dragon just feeds him the data? It would take some time, but Satoru figures he might as well multitask while in this magical world. Plus, he's itching to find other people from his world. So, he proposes to the dragon, how about you hop in my stomach, and together, we'll unlock this prison like a dynamic duo. The dragon finds this proposal absolutely hilarious and agrees. Satoru is puzzled by the dragon's hearty laughter, but hey, teamwork makes the dream work. 
Before the dragon becomes one with Satoru's digestive system, they decide to give each other names. Satoru christens the dragon Tempest, and the dragon dubs Satoru Rimuru. These names aren't just for show, they're engraved on their souls. With the formalities out of the way, Rimuru swallows both the imprisonment spell and Tempest. The cave where Veldora had been trapped is located in the Great Forest of Jura, a region with several neighboring countries. In one of these countries, the Kingdom of Belmond, Minister Baron Vriard has some pressing questions. He consults Guildmaster Fuse about the mysterious disappearance of Veldora, the Storm Dragon. Fuse knows about the dragon and promises to investigate personally, making sure to keep an eye on the Great Forest of Jura and the other kingdoms. Little does Rimuru know, his actions are setting off a chain reaction of chaos in the surrounding nations. Meanwhile, Rimuru explores the cave for an exit, spending days munching on herbs and ores and gaining new skills left and right. He now has water manipulation skills, which he combines with his water pressure propulsion and water movement abilities to become a bona fide waterbender. Rimuru also encounters a black serpent and gains a poisonous breath skill, making his breath fresh in more ways than one. He even runs into an Armorosaurus, defeats it, and acquires body armor. It's like he's collecting skills like trading cards. As weeks pass in his cave adventures, Rimuru stumbles upon a wooden door. It magically opens, revealing three adventurers on the other side. Rimuru eavesdrops on their conversation thanks to his nifty magic sense, and he realizes these are the first humans he's seen in this world. One of the adventurers uses a stealth art to make everyone invisible, leaving Rimuru flabbergasted. Emerging from the cave, the adventurers sense something amiss but shrug it off. Rimuru realizes he has a lot of stories to concoct for Veldora when they reunite, thinking about all the bizarre encounters he's had so far. Just as he ponders Veldora's reaction to his tales, a group of tiny goblins appears before him, armed to the teeth. The goblins are trembling in fear, and one of them tentatively calls Rimuru a strong one. Rimuru decides to assert his dominance and introduces himself with a booming voice, inadvertently scaring the goblins to their knees. They beg him to stop, and Rimuru, feeling a bit like a rock star, listens to their tale. The goblins sensed a powerful monster and ventured into the forest to investigate. With Rimuru's immense power, they request his assistance. Rimuru obliges and is escorted to the goblin village, where he meets the elder. As it turns out, the goblin's god had disappeared a month ago, and that god is none other than Veldora. Without Veldora's protection, the goblins have been under attack by other monsters, and they implore Rimuru for help. Rimuru maintains his modesty, even though his power is radiating like a neon sign. Eventually, he agrees to help the goblins, who have faced tragedy with the loss of a hundred direwolves and the elder's son. In exchange for his protection, the goblins pledge their loyalty to him. As they discuss their situation, the direwolves begin to howl, sending shivers down the goblins' spines. Rimuru steps up as their newfound hope, and just like that, he becomes the goblin leader. After Rimuru swallowed Veldora, they embarked on the arduous journey of analyzing the seal together, with the ultimate goal of setting Veldora free. But Rimuru's adventures didn't stop there. As he emerged from the cave, he encountered a group of goblins in dire need of assistance. These goblins were beaten down and scrawny, clearly no match for the direwolves threatening their village. Rimuru, being the compassionate slime he is, tried to lift the spirits of these downtrodden goblins. He encouraged them with words of hope and unity. However, before he could fully motivate them, he decided to visit the wounded goblins in one of the huts. What he saw was a goblin with deep wounds in dire need of medical attention. Rimuru, not one to stand by idly, absorbed one of the wounded goblins and promptly threw it away, completely healed. The goblin looked puzzled for a moment, then realized it felt better than ever. Rimuru repeated this miraculous act for all the wounded goblins, tossing potions from his body like they were party favors. The goblins were now not only healed but also astounded. Their elder couldn't believe his eyes as he witnessed Rimuru's extraordinary healing abilities. He immediately ordered the goblins to start building a fence and fortifying their village against the impending direwolf attack. Speaking of the direwolves, they weren't about to let the goblins off easy. Led by their pack leader, they launched an attack on the village, howling their intentions. When they reached the village, they were met with a flimsy-looking fence. The pack leader, brimming with arrogance, ordered his pack to trample the fence and shed goblin blood. As the wolves charged, many of them met their doom thanks to a cleverly placed steel thread trap set up by Rimuru. The pack leader, however, wasn't deterred. He charged at Rimuru, furious at the mere sight of a slime giving orders. But Rimuru had a few tricks up his metaphorical sleeve. The leader found himself trapped by sticky threads and promptly lost his head to Rimuru's water blade. Rimuru, now a wolf thanks to his mimic ability, tried to warn the pack to submit or face dire consequences. Unfortunately, the pack couldn't understand him, so Rimuru absorbed the deceased leader, gaining his skills, including the ability to communicate through thoughts, heightened senses of smell, and a menacing aura. Transformed into a wolf, Rimuru decided to assert his newfound authority. The rest of the pack wisely yielded to Rimuru's leadership. 
The battle was over, but now Rimuru had to deal with a goblin and wolf alliance. He paired them up and ordered them to work together, ensuring peace in his budding community. Naming was Rimuru's secret weapon. By giving names to just a few, he inadvertently raised the rank of all monsters, causing them to evolve. The goblins and wolves weren't scrawny anymore, they were a force to be reckoned with. Even the elder, Rigard, had transformed into a muscle-bound powerhouse. Rimuru, realizing the potential of naming, declared Rigard as the goblin lord and laid down some laws for the community to follow. But there were still problems to solve. Houses and clothes were on the top of the list. Rigard suggested seeking the help of dwarves, who were renowned for their craftsmanship. With a new mission in mind, Rimuru set off on a journey towards the Kingdom of Dwarves, leaving behind a community of goblins and wolves ready to take on the world. Following the Emiled River north, Rimuru, accompanied by Ranga, a few other wolves, and goblins, embarked on their journey towards Dwargan, the Kingdom of Dwarves. Alongside them were Rigor, two other goblins, and Gopta, their trusty guide who had visited Dwargan before. As they settled in their camp one evening, Rigor revealed that he had been named by a passing demon named Lord Jelmud, an officer in the Demon Lord's army. This revelation piqued Rimuru's interest in the complex world of demon lords and heroes, but he had one clear goal, to avoid getting tangled up with either of them. Rimuru turned to Ranga and asked if he held any grudge for Rimuru's role in his father's demise. However, Ranga's loyalty was unwavering, and he declared his gratitude to Rimuru alone. Their destination was the armed nation of Dwargan, a city beautifully constructed within a modified natural cave system. It was home to various races, including dwarves, humans, and even elves. The dwarf king, Gazel Dwargo, was renowned as the hero king. As Gobda provided more information about Dwargo, Rimuru couldn't help but imagine the beauty of elves. Dwargo was a neutral trade center, and its military might was unparalleled. Fighting within the kingdom was strictly prohibited, as the Dwargo army had been undefeated for a thousand years. Anyone who provoked them was deemed a dumb. After a three-day journey, they finally reached Dwargan, thanks to Ranga and his fellow wolves. Rimuru, still daydreaming about beautiful elves, decided to take Gopta with him while instructing the others to remain outside to avoid drawing attention. However, even at the entrance gate, a long line awaited them. As they stood in line, two troublemakers set their sights on Gopta, aiming to capture Rimuru due to his rarity as a talking slime. Rimuru ordered Gopta to close his eyes and ears and stepped forward to handle the thugs. Transforming into a tempest wolf, Rimuru attempted to scare them off. But the thugs weren't so easily dissuaded and called for backup. They began attacking Rimuru, whose slimy body proved impervious to their blows. In a final attempt, Rimuru unleashed his menace attack, causing chaos and fear. Sixteen people fled, sixty-eight were left bewildered, ninety-two fainted, and thirty-four had less control over their bladders. Amidst the chaos, Rimuru and Gobta were captured by the head of security, Kaido. Rimuru apologized for the trouble they caused, but before Kaido could release them, his subordinate informed him of an armor Sarasu in the mine which posed a significant threat to the miners. The miners were gravely injured, and Kaido lacked the necessary magic potion to heal them. Rimuru offered Kaido his own healing potion, which saved the miners' lives. Grateful for Rimuru's assistance, Kaido released them, treated them to a meal, and shared his reason for being in Dwargan. The next day, accompanied by Kaido, Rimuru ventured into the city. Kaido introduced him to skilled blacksmiths, including his own brother, Kaijin Blacksmith. Three miners who had been saved by Rimuru's healing potion also joined them, and they shared their tale of Rimuru's heroics with Kaijin. Kaijin apologized for not being able to help more, as he was currently swamped with crafting 20 longswords for Minister Vesta. These swords needed to be delivered by the end of the week, and he had only managed to complete one due to a shortage of materials. Kaijin had initially declined the order but was manipulated into accepting it through gaslighting. Kaijin was also short on magic ore, which was what the miners had been attempting to extract before the trouble occurred. If he failed to deliver the swords, his blacksmithing license would be revoked. Rimuru came to the rescue, throwing up the much-needed magic ore, impressing Kaijin with its purity. In gratitude for Rimuru's help with mending the goblin's clothing and homes, Kaijin got to work on his sword crafting. Rimuru requested one of the completed swords, absorbed it, and asked the sage voice to create duplicates. Moments later, Rimuru astonished everyone by producing twenty identical longswords. Kaijin and the others decided to throw a party for Rimuru with the butterflies of the night. Initially hesitant, Rimuru couldn't resist the allure when he heard the word elves. Entering the pub, he was warmly welcomed by a group of beautiful elves, who immediately began hugging him, much to Rimuru's delight. The party had officially begun. Continuing with the story, we find Rimuru enjoying a pleasant time at the bar, resting comfortably in the lap of an elf under the shade of her opai, while Gobder remains blissfully unaware, sound asleep in jail. One of the elves starts making gestures, which Rimuru misinterprets as some sort of erotic signals. He's momentarily perplexed, but when he notices a glass globe, it dawns on him that she's attempting to perform fortune-telling. 
The elf offers to reveal Rimuru's life partner, and although Rimuru doesn't have any specific inquiries in mind, he agrees to the playful suggestion. The elf begins to cast the spell, first jokingly, and then with a more serious intent. She gazes into the glass globe and envisions a pretty girl among other details. As they discuss the vision, Minister Vesta unexpectedly appears, mocking Kaijin for wasting time with such frivolous activities. Rimuru starts pondering whether Vesta gave Kaijin an impossible task on purpose and wonders about the relationship between the two. Vesta redirects his attention toward Rimuru, insulting him as a lowly monster and berating Kaijin for bringing it into a high-class establishment. The elf bartender tries to calm Vesta down with a drink, but Vesta escalates things by pouring a jug of wine onto Rimuru, who had been resting comfortably in the elf's lap. Rimuru manages to keep his temper in check, considering Vesta's position as minister. However, Kaijin steps in, delivering a surprise punch to Vesta, who didn't see it coming. Rimuru cheers Kaijin on, suggesting he goes for the face instead of the body. Kaijin lands another punch, sending Vesta sprawling to the floor. Rimuru inquires if hitting the minister would cause problems, but Kaijin responds by asking Rimuru if he'd accept him as his artisan. Rimuru happily agrees. Kaido intervenes and takes Rimuru and Kaijin into custody until their trial. Kaijin apologizes to everyone for dragging them into his troubles. Rimuru questions Kaijin about Vesta's grudge against him, learning that Kaijin used to serve Gazel Dwargo as the captain of one of the seven orders of royal knights, while Vesta was his subordinate. Vesta, being from a noble family, had disdain for Kaijin's peasant origins and unjustly placed blame on him for a major project failure with false testimonies. Kaijin eventually resigned and became a blacksmith, and Vesta took every opportunity to ruin his life. Kaijin and his subordinates agree to become artisans under Rimuru. The next day, the trial begins with King Gazel Dwargo presiding. The king makes a grand entrance, exuding a strong presence that leaves Rimuru genuinely impressed. The trial commences with the lawyer blaming Kaijin and his group. After hearing the arguments, the trial concludes with Kaijin and his subordinates sentenced to a decade of hard labor in the mines. When offered the chance to return as captain of the Knight Order, Kaijin refuses, having already pledged his loyalty to a new master. This decision angers the king, who orders Kaijin to leave his sight and punishes the gang with exile. The king appears somewhat saddened by the outcome. After the court session ends, the king instructs Vesta to speak the truth, revealing that he had known all along about Vesta's lies. Despite Vesta's intentions to be useful, the king is also upset with him for severing their connection with Rimuru, who had provided them with a 100% effective healing potion, an impossibility for the dwarves to replicate. The king leaves the court while Vesta breaks down in tears, reflecting on the first time he saw Gazel Dwargo. Vesta pleads for forgiveness from the king, but the king commands him never to show his face again. Kaido bids farewell to Kaijin and his group before they go into exile. Despite the chaos, Rimuru successfully achieves his initial goal of bringing skilled artisans to the goblin village. As the story unfolds, Dwargo orders a spy to keep an eye on the slime, recognizing that Rimuru is the true monster, much like the storm dragon Veldora. In the Free Union Guild of the Blue Moon Kingdom, Fuse reviews reports that indicate no signs of the Eastern Empire attempting to cross the Great Forest of Jura. These reports are presented by Cavill, Iren, and Gaido, adventurers whom Rimuru encountered when leaving the cave. Fuse orders them to investigate the forest after they return from their three-day vacation. He knows that monsters will likely be unusually active following Veldora's disappearance. As they set out, the adventurers express frustration at their guild master for assigning them challenging tasks. Suddenly, a masked warrior woman named Shizu appears and inquires if they were discussing the Jira forest. She requests to accompany them on their investigation, and Iren agrees. Shizu introduces herself to the group, and Rimuru's presence is revealed. Rimuru transforms into a Tempest Wolf to train Ranga, his loyal companion. A few weeks have passed since Rimuru's return to the goblin village with the dwarves. The goblins watch Kaijin, the skilled blacksmith, closely as he works. With the dwarves' help, they aim to improve and fortify the goblin village to ensure peace and prosperity. Rimuru has also named all 500 of the new goblins who sought shelter in the village after hearing about Rimuru's heroics against the wolves. Rigard, promoted from goblin lord to goblin king, reports to Rimuru about some humans discovered in the forest. These humans are from a nation seeking to expand its dominion. The adventurers, meanwhile, are fleeing from a giant ant that Cavill inadvertently provoked. Shizu intervenes, demonstrating her powerful fire sword abilities to defeat the ants. Afterward, a bolt of black lightning reduces the last ant to dust, revealing Rimuru's presence. Rimuru returns Shizu's mask, recognizing her as the same girl shown to him by the elf as his potential partner. Rimuru leads the adventurers to the goblin village, where they express gratitude for saving them from monsters and providing food. 
Cavill introduces their group, and Shizu discusses their plans to investigate Veldora's disappearance. They seek Rimuru's permission to conduct their investigation and are offered a night's stay in the Goblin Village. In the evening, Rimuru finds Shizu alone, watching the sunset. He asks if she is also from Japan, and she confirms. Rimuru then opens up and shares his entire story with Shizu. She holds Rimuru in her arms, which makes him feel shy and blush. During this moment, Rimuru uses thought communication to show Shizu his memories, and she enjoys the view. However, Shizu suddenly feels weak and falls to her knees. Kaijin appears, seeking advice about the location of a new house, as Shizu recalls the time when she was summoned during World War II, and her body was offered to the fire demon Ifrit. As Shizu struggled with the memories of her past, she recalled the time when she was summoned by demon Lord Leon. During their encounter, the great sorcerer Koenig had also appeared to challenge Lord Leon. Leon controlled Shizu and used her powers to reduce Koenig to ashes. However, Shizu had made a friend during her time as a summoning, a girl of the same age. The girl had found a dog and brought it into the castle, where animals were forbidden. The dog barked at Leon, causing Shizu's body to react uncontrollably, and she inadvertently burned the dog and the girl. This incident left Shizu confused and devastated, as she cried over taking someone's life. Shizu's nightmares were haunting her, and she woke up with her body trembling, struggling to control her powers. She decided to leave the goblin village, explaining to Rimuru that she wanted to find the man who had summoned her. The adventurers also chose to depart. However, as Shizu was leaving the village, her body suddenly transformed into her flame form. Cavill recognized her as Shizu Izawa, the Conqueror of Flames, and Iren had heard of her as a hero from the guild 50 years ago. Rimuru ordered Rigor to evacuate the village and revealed that he had a plan. The fire spirit of Ifrit was released, and Ifrit began attacking the village, summoning little demons that set everything ablaze. Cavill decided to stay and fight alongside Rimuru. As Rimuru attempted to reason with Ifrit, Ifrit launched an attack at him. Rimuru dodged and retaliated with his water blade but it evaporated upon contact with Ifrit. The demons attempted to attack Rimuru, but Eren used her magic to distract them. Rimuru summoned Ranga and instructed him to focus on evading attacks while he handled the demons. Rimuru needed to deal with the demons first before confronting Ifrit. He asked the sage voice if he could expel all the water in his belly at once. The voice confirmed that it was possible but warned that it would cause a steam explosion when the water came into contact with a salamander, potentially causing widespread destruction. Rimuru observed that Eren's magic attacks were effective against the salamanders. He ordered her to continue her assault, and he analyzed her attacks to devise a strategy. Rimuru then used his ice shotgun to attack the salamanders. The remaining salamander resorted to self-destruction in a desperate attempt to harm the adventurers. Rimuru ordered Ranga to evacuate the adventurers to safety while he confronted Ifrit. Rimuru challenged Ifrit, who responded by summoning identical images of himself. Rimuru quickly dispatched the duplicates using his ice shotgun. Suddenly, a magic circle appeared beneath Rimuru, and Ifrit launched a powerful attack called Flare Circle. Although Rimuru appeared to have been consumed by the flames, he felt no pain or burning because his unique abilities nullified fire damage. Everything was going according to Rimuru's plan. Ifrit, thinking that Rimuru had been defeated, began to retreat. However, as he stepped back, Rimuru ensnared him in steel threads. Rimuru revealed to Ifrit that he had underestimated him, but not as much as Ifrit had underestimated Rimuru. With that, Rimuru absorbed Ifrit using his predator skill, and Ifrit found himself within Rimuru's belly, where he encountered Veldora. Veldora warned Ifrit not to engage in battle with Rimuru due to their sworn friendship, as Ifrit realized that he was no match for Rimuru. Shizu expressed her gratitude to Rimuru for helping her cope with the guilt and pain she had carried for so long, especially after unintentionally causing the death of her friend. She recounted her journey and explained how she had been possessed by Ifrit after her summoning, serving as the Demon Lord's closest aid until the hero confronted her. During a battle between the hero and the Demon Lord, Shizu found herself abandoned by her master, who fled his castle, leaving her behind as the rear guard. The hero defeated Shizu and took her in, asking about her loyalty to the Demon Lord. Shizu confessed her past and cried in the hero's arms. In response, the hero provided Shizu with a mask that boosted her magic resistance and suppressed the influence of Ifrit within her. She accompanied the hero on various adventures, using her abilities to help people and earning her title as the Conqueror of Flames. However, the hero eventually disappeared, leaving Shizu behind. She continued her journey, but as she aged, it became increasingly challenging for her to control Ifrit. 
She eventually retired and became a schoolteacher in the kingdom of Ingracia, teaching children from other worlds. Despite some of her students leaving to pursue their own paths, one of them became the grandmaster responsible for establishing guilds in various countries. As time passed, Shizu found it more difficult to restrain Ifrit's power, leading her to embark on a journey to find the man who had originally summoned her. Shizu asked Rimuru for a favor before her passing, to absorb her into his being so she could find peace away from this world. Her final wish was for Rimuru to locate the demon lord and persuade him to return the children who had been summoned to this world and acknowledge Shizu's existence. Rimuru agreed to fulfill Shizu's last wish, and she was peacefully absorbed into him. The adventurers, Cavill, Iren, and Gaido, entered the room to find that Rimuru had completely transformed into a human, capable of mimicking Shizu's appearance. Rimuru apologized for not consulting with them earlier but explained that it was the only way to provide a proper burial for Shizu. Iren expressed her desire to bid a final farewell to Shizu and after they paid their respects, the adventurers left the village, thanking Rimuru for everything. They later encountered Kaijin and the three dwarf brothers, who were already famous worldwide. After exchanging greetings, the adventurers departed, leaving behind the girl who had once lost everything to flames but had gained the power of fire during her travels, ultimately succumbing to its consuming nature. Rimuru created a grave for Shizu, but he knew that before he could seek vengeance against the demon Leon Cromwell, who had made Shizu cry, he needed to gather more information. As the story unfolded, Rimuru reflected on his extraordinary journey from an ordinary life, getting reincarnated as a slime, befriending a storm dragon, and forming a deep connection with a human woman named Shizu. Meanwhile, in a barren land, an orc named Geld fell unconscious due to hunger and thirst. An elf named Jelmut approached Geld and offered him food and a new name, designating him as the one who would take control of the great forest of Jura and become the orc disaster. The development of the goblin village was progressing well. With the help of Kaijin and the dwarves, they had manufactured clothes and tools for building more houses. Additionally, the goblin lords under Rigard had been working on establishing a governance system for the village. Everything seemed to be going smoothly. However, Rimuru felt there was something important he needed to do. He entered a house when no one was watching and repaired Shizu's broken mask, deciding to keep it as a memento of her. Rimuru then transformed into Shizu to test the hearing, vision, and speaking capabilities of his human form. He also inquired if he could utilize Ifrit's skills. The Great Sage confirmed that all of Ifrit's skills had been analyzed. Rimuru used his body double technique to create a copy of himself and began analyzing it. During this self-discovery, Rimuru realized that he had no gender in his human form, just as he had none as a slime. He also discovered that he could control the age of his summoned form. While walking around the village, Rimuru suddenly realized that he could now taste food and decided to join the goblins for a feast prepared by Rigard. During this time, he noticed Rigard and a group of goblins preparing to hunt for a great bull deer, which Rimuru approved of. However, Ranga interrupted with a thought communication, informing Rimuru that they were being attacked by some orcs. Rimuru rushed to the scene to find Gobda injured. He healed Gobda with a magic potion, and Ranga was engaged in a battle with two orcs. Rigard was fighting an orc lady who had put some goblins to sleep with her magic. Rimuru called back Ranga and Rigard to assess the situation. The orcs were unlike any Rimuru had encountered in video games. They wore armor and wielded katanas, and there were six of them. Rimuru attempted to reason with them, but the orcs were enraged due to the earlier pig attack and refused to listen. They also realized that Rimuru was concealing his true identity. With no other option, Rimuru decided to fight the orcs. He instructed Ranga to take care of the pink-haired orc lady who had used magic to put the goblins to sleep. Rimuru engaged the other five orcs in battle, using various skills and tactics to incapacitate them. During the battle, Rimuru's arm was severed, but he calmly reattached it, shocking the orcs. When he finally unmasked himself, revealing the intimidating black flames, the orcs grew worried. Rimuru used this display of power to establish his dominance. As Rimuru attempted to explain the situation, the old orc, who had been observing, cut off Rimuru's arm to test his regeneration abilities. The orc prince, however, decided to continue the fight, driven by his pride as the next leader of the ogre clan. Rimuru showed off his strength, causing the princess ogre to intervene and persuade the prince to cease the fight. The princess ogre believed that Rimuru was not the evil magin who had attacked the ogre clan with an army of pigs, slaying many ogres. Rimuru revealed his true form and provided the mask he had repaired as evidence. The prince ogre apologized for misunderstanding Rimuru and the goblins, and Rimuru invited them to share their story. As Rimuru asked for their names, the prince ogre explained that ogres didn't typically have names. They all headed back to the goblin village, where ogres and goblins reconciled and began to learn more about each other. As the goblins served the feast they had prepared, they were concerned about whether Rimuru would enjoy the food. 
For Rimuru, this was the first time he had tasted food in a long while, as he had grown used to being tasteless as a slime. Fortunately, Rimuru found the food to his liking, much to the relief of the goblin's cook. The ogres were also partaking in the feast, enjoying the meal alongside their new allies. Kaijin was baffled when the princess informed him that they had been attacked by orcs, as ogres were vastly stronger than orcs, and such an attack seemed unthinkable. The orcs had attacked their village out of nowhere, and they had come well armed and armored. There was a masked magin among them, which indicated that the orcs might be aligned with one of the demon lords. The prince ogre explained that only three of his six brothers had managed to escape the orc attack. Rimuru joined the conversation and asked the prince about their plans, whether they intended to rebuild their village or relocate it to a safer area. The prince's decision would determine the fate of his comrades. After some contemplation, the prince decided that they would seek revenge against the orcs once they were strong enough. Rimuru offered his help, proposing to make the ogres his subordinates, providing them with food, shelter, and clothing in exchange for their cooperation. The goblin village wasn't entirely safe either, which is why increasing their numbers with strong allies would benefit them. Rimuru assured the ogres that he would fight alongside them and never abandon them. The prince needed some time to consider the offer and went off alone to think. Eventually, the prince accepted Rimuru's proposal, but he decided to form a contract that would last only until the orc leader was defeated. After that, they could do as they pleased. Rimuru felt sympathy for the prince, who had to make difficult decisions as a leader. Rimuru transformed into his human form and began naming the ogres. However, he fainted before he could finish naming them. When he woke up, he found himself in the lap of the lady ogre, under the shade of her ample bosom. To Rimuru's surprise, the ogres had evolved into a new race called Kijin. The prince introduced himself as Benimaru. The great sage explained that Kijin were an uncommon race born from ogres. Rimuru continued to name the ogres, giving them the names Shuna, Shen, Hakuru, Sawe, and Kirob. The orc army, meanwhile, was on the move in the forest. In the middle of the Jira forest lay Lake Sis, surrounded by vast marshlands. This area was controlled by the lizardmen. The lizardmen reported the sighting of an orc army of approximately 200,000 to their king. This was twice the size of the lizardmen's army, causing concern among the king and his advisor. The advisor realized that only one entity could control such a massive orc army, the legendary orc lord, a unique monster that could even devour the fear, and terror of its own allies. The Lizardmen's chances of victory were low, so the king decided to call for backup. He summoned his son, Gabaru, who was irritated that his father had not called him by his name, which was given to him by demon lord Jel Mud. Hakuru, one of Rimuru's new ogre subordinates, was teaching goblin children swordsmanship. Benimaru shared the legend of the orc lord with Rimuru and mentioned that shortly before the orc attack, a suspicious magin had visited their village, wanting to name the ogres. However, Benimaru had turned him down, and the magin, who was revealed to be demon lord Jelmud, had cursed him as he left. Sawi informed Rimuru that he had spotted some lizard men, which was unusual. Gabaru was on his way to fulfill his father's order to seek an alliance with the goblin village, although he was annoyed that his father sought help from others against mere orcs. With the addition of Benimaru and his ogre comrades to the goblin village, life was becoming more lively and bustling. Shuna, one of the ogres, was busy weaving skill cloths made from Hellsmoth, a sturdy cloth rich in magicules that provided excellent protection. Rimuru entered the room where Shuna and the dwarves were working, and she rushed over to hug him, much to the chagrin of Shin, who was carrying Rimuru. The weaving loom that Kaijin had made was easy to use, and Shin declared herself as Rimuru's secretary, a role that Rimuru accepted with amusement. Both Shuna and Shin seemed jealous of each other and insisted on taking care of Rimuru. In the male ogre room, Benimaru and the others were making themselves at home. Shin offered to cook for Rimuru, which made Benimaru nervous since he knew that Shin was a terrible cook. When Rimuru tasted her cooking, he quickly realized why Benimaru was sweating with anxiety. Gobda also took a bite and promptly fainted. Rimuru decided that Shin needed Benimaru's approval for her cooking. Meanwhile, Gabaru, the Lizardman Prince, continued his efforts to gather the cooperation of various goblin groups. They had managed to gather nearly 7,000 goblins so far. One of his subordinates informed Gabaru about another village where goblins had tamed direwolves, and their leader was said to be a slime. Gabaru decided to head towards this village to seek their alliance. Rimuru spent some time watching Korub and Kaijin discuss technical matters, while Rigor reported the arrival of a Lizardman envoy. Rimuru, along with Benimaru and other ogres, went to meet them. The Lizardman envoy arrived with a dramatic entrance orchestrated by Gabaru. Gabaru introduced himself with an air of arrogance, calling everyone else weaklings. Rimuru had to consider the alliance carefully because Gabaru came across as rather foolish. Rimuru recalled a famous quotation by Napoleon, which stated that one should fear not a competent enemy, but an incompetent ally. 
Gaburu continued to boast about his strength and Shin grew angry. She squeezed Rimuru and he reminded her to take Benimaru's approval when cooking. Gaburu then laughed at Rimuru, claiming the credit for taming the direwolves. Rimuru summoned Ranga and told Gaburu that Ranga would speak for himself. However, Gaburu continued to disrespect Rimuru and challenged him to a fight. The other lizardmen began chanting Gaburu's name. Ranga was furious at a mere lizardman daring to insult his master. Suddenly, Gobda appeared out of nowhere, shocking Rimuru who had believed Gobda to be unconscious after eating Shin's cooking. Ranga took Gobda and asked Gaburu to defeat him. If Gaburu won, Ranga would consider Gaburu's offer to become his subordinate. Rimuru motivated Gobda, promising to order Kaijin to forge a special weapon just for him if he won. On the other hand, if Gobda lost, he would have to eat food cooked by Shin. Hearing these stakes, Gobda suddenly turned powerful, striking Gaburu with a powerful kick to the back of his head. The lizardmen were in complete shock, even Rimuru was astounded by Gobda's abilities. Gobda defeated Gaburu with a single blow, and the ogres and Ranga praised him. Rimuru told the lizardmen that he would consider their offer for an alliance but emphasized that they would not serve the lizardmen under any circumstances. He also requested that they take the unconscious Gaburu back to their village for the time being. As the lizardmen departed with Gaburu, Rimuru and his companions contemplated their next steps. Meanwhile, the orc army was advancing toward the lizardmen's territory. Shaui had spotted the approaching army and reported it to Rimuru. Kaijin and others speculated that someone might be controlling the orcs, as orcs were not known for their intelligence. Rimuru wondered if the demon lord Jelman might be behind the orc alliance, but it was just a possibility. Rimuru and his companions also planned to meet with one of the body doubles who had come into contact with a dryad and requested an audience. Dryads were tree spirits, and it had been several decades since the last time one had appeared. Rimuru ordered the dryad to be brought before him, and she materialized from a tree, introducing herself as Trainee. Trainee had come with a request, she wanted Rimuru to defeat the orc lord. As the conference with Trainee, the dryad, continued, Benimaru questioned her true motive for seeking their help. Trainee explained that she might have approached the ogres if their clan had survived but ultimately chose to ask the goblins because of their connection to Rimuru. She acknowledged Rimuru's immense power and considered him a valuable ally. Trainee confirmed the existence of the orc lord, revealing that dryads had knowledge of the events within the forest. She mentioned that the orcs were driven by the orc lord's unique skill called Starved, which compelled them to devour everything in their path, even their own dead comrades. This insatiable hunger for power led them to consume their fallen comrades, acquiring their skills in the process. Trainee emphasized that the orc lord's desire for power was insatiable, and his army would continue to rampage unchecked. Rimuru accepted Trainee's request after consulting with the Great Sage. They discussed forming an alliance with the Lizardmen to combat the Orc threat. Sawe volunteered to take the message from Rimuru to the Lizardmen chieftain. Meanwhile, Gaburu, who had been unconscious, awoke and started to believe that Gopta was the true leader of the Goblin Village. To his surprise, a masked Majin named Laplace appeared before him. Laplace introduced himself as a servant of Demon Lord Jelmud and delivered a warning to Gaburu. Jelmud intended to groom Gaburu as the next chieftain of the Lizardmen. Gaburu left for the marshlands, leaving Laplace behind. The orc army continued its advance toward the marshlands, posing a grave threat. Sawe reached the lizardman chieftain and delivered Rimuru's message, explaining that Rimuru Tempest had received a personal request from the dryads to defeat the approaching orc army. The lizardman chieftain, who had never heard of Rimuru, was shocked to learn that the request came directly from a dryad. Sawe also informed them that the orc army was led by the formidable orc lord. The Lizardmen had no choice but to accept the alliance. However, one of the Lizardmen disrespected Rimuru, prompting Sawe to use his steel threads to admonish him, nearly beheading the Lizardmen. The chieftain apologized for the behavior of his advisor. The chieftain had one condition, he wanted to meet Rimuru in person. Sawe agreed to make the necessary preparations within seven days, allowing the chieftain to have an audience with Rimuru. Until then, the lizardmen were to refrain from engaging in battle or conflict. Sawe, Sawe's fellow ninja, suddenly disappeared during this exchange. The chieftain felt a glimmer of hope and quickly gathered all the lizardmen who could fight, informing them about the powerful reinforcements and the impending alliance. Meanwhile, Gaburu had returned, boasting about the 7,000 goblins he had recruited. He insisted on fighting the orc army rather than waiting for reinforcements. Gaburu challenged his father's leadership, claiming him to be too old to make the right decisions. He seized the throne, imprisoned the chieftain and his sister, and took possession of his father's vortex spear trident. Gaburu was overconfident and decided to engage the orcs in battle, using a hit and withdraw tactic. The lizardmen fought valiantly, but Gaburu's lack of understanding of the true terror of the orc lord became apparent. Rimuru and his companions, including Sawe, Hakuru, Benimaru, Shin, 
Gobta, and some goblin students were en route to the marshlands to assist the lizardmen. They remained unaware of the situation involving the imprisoned chieftain and Gabaru's engagement in battle with the orcs. Sawi reported that he was witnessing a battle between a group of lizardmen and high-ranking orcs. Among them was a personal guard to the lizardman chieftain who was struggling against a high-ranking orc. Rimuru immediately ordered Sawi to intervene and assist the lizardmen. Sawi, without hesitation, launched an attack on the orcs, brutally dispatching them. The injured lizardman guard was healed with a healing potion provided by Rimuru who then introduced himself to the Lizardman. The Lizardman guard pleaded with Rimuru to save her father, the chieftain, and her brother Gabaru. She explained the situation, including Gabaru's rebellion, to Rimuru. Shin comforted her, and Rimuru ordered Sawi to free the Lizardman chieftain from imprisonment. Meanwhile, the battle between the orcs and Lizardmen raged on. The Lizardmen were terrorized when they witnessed the orcs devouring one of their own. The orcs' consumption of a lizardman allowed them to move faster and adopt lizardman-like traits. Gabaru ordered a close formation to retreat, but the orcs had already surrounded them. As the orcs closed in, an orc general appeared before Gabaru. His immense aura filled Gabaru with dread as he pondered the power gap between the orc general and the feared orc lord. Gabaru, determined to prove himself, challenged the orc general to a one-on-one -on -one battle, which the general accepted. The battle between Gabaru and the Orc General began with exchanged blows. The Lizardmen chanted Gabaru's name in support. The Orc General unleashed a devastating attack named Chaos Eater, which Gabaru narrowly dodged before counterattacking. However, the Orc General blocked Gabaru's attack with his shield and landed a powerful blow, throwing Gabaru back toward the Lizardmen. Just as the Orc General was about to finish off Gabaru, Gobda intervened to stop the attack. Using their shadow movement, Rimuru, Benimaru, Hakuru, and Shin appeared on the scene. Rimuru initiated a barrage of black flames, obliterating multiple orcs. Benimaru, Hakuru, and Shin joined the fray to seek revenge for their fallen comrades. Fear began to grip the orcs as Rimuru continued to rain down destruction upon them. Rimuru, now with wings, watched the battle unfold. Ranga summoned a massive tornado named Deathstorm that instantly killed the orc general. Ranga had evolved into a Tempest Star Wolf with two horns, becoming even more powerful. The orcs were overwhelmed by the combined might of the ogres and Rimuru's forces, leading to their swift defeat. Sawi freed the Lizardman chieftain from captivity, and Sauri swiftly dispatched any remaining threats. Jelmud, observing the battle from his magic globe, grew furious at his defeat and attempted to break the globe when Sawi warned him. Using the orc general, Jelmud realized he needed to take action before his plans crumbled. Rimuru, with determination, located the Orc Lord as the next step in their battle against the Orc forces. Jelmud confronted Rimuru and Benimaru's group, cursing them for thwarting his plan to create a new demon lord that would serve him. He explained that he had been sowing seeds, giving out many names, and creating ultimate pawns to achieve his goals. Jelmud then ordered the Orc Lord to attack, and the Orc Lord inquired about evolving into a demon lord. Jelmud revealed his intention for the Orc Lord to become Demon Lord Orc Disaster, a plan devised by Jelmud and his master. Jelmud launched an attack on Gabaru, but Gabaru's subordinates sacrificed themselves to block the attack. Rimuru intervened and provided healing potions to the Lizardmen. He then used his sticky threads to immobilize Jelmud and delivered two powerful punches. Jelmud, in fear, stammered and asked Rimuru to join him. In response, Rimuru kicked Jelmud hard and inquired about his master. Jelmud ordered the Orc Lord to attack Rimuru, but instead, the Orc Lord beheaded Jelmud in a single blow and devoured his body, absorbing his skills and magical abilities. The Orc Lord then began to evolve into Demon Lord Orc Disaster and introduced himself as Geld, the Demon Lord. Shin rushed to attack Geld, and Hakuru beheaded him, but Geld quickly regenerated and reattached his head. Sawe used arcane thread fetters to bind Geld in threads, Benimaru unleashed black flames, and Ranga attacked with black lightning. Although they inflicted some damage, Geld proved resilient. Geld absorbed another orc, gaining further healing abilities. He launched an attack similar to one used by Jelmud, but Rimuru absorbed it using his powers. Rimuru stepped forward to fight, utilizing Great Sage in auto battle mode. Geld attempted to use Chaos Eater, but Great Sage cut off Geld's arm and began to overpower him. Geld moved swiftly, but Rimuru managed to block his attacks. Geld grabbed Rimuru's hand, but Rimuru retaliated with Flare Circle, which burned Geld. However, Geld was fire resistant. Rimuru took over the battle and asked Great Sage to rest. He figured out how to defeat the Orc Disaster. Before Geld could devour Rimuru, Rimuru initiated the process of absorbing the Orc Disaster. The two beings began a battle of consciousness while their physical forms clashed. Rimuru could see the memories of the Orc Disaster, known as the Orc King, who had suffered through famine, losing his offspring to hunger while under the control of Starved. 
Geld's tragic past was revealed to Rimuru. The Orc Lord, worried for his brethren, was assured by Rimuru that their sins would be forgiven. Finally, the Orc disaster was absorbed, and the goblins began to chant in victory. After the battle, Rimuru informed the Kijin that they were free to go their own way. However, Benimaru requested to pledge their allegiance to Rimuru, wanting to continue serving him until their lives came to an end. After the epic showdown between the Orcs and the Alliance, representatives from each race gathered to discuss the aftermath of the battle. In a surprising twist, Rimuru emerged as the chairman of the Jura Forest. Starting with the Orcs, Rimuru decided not to press any charges against them, leaving the Orcs utterly flabbergasted. With a mischievous glint in his eye, Rimuru explained that the root cause of the battle was hunger and famine conditions that could have driven any race to the brink. He even cheekily declared that he had taken on the orc's sins as part of a promise to demon lord Geld. The ogres, known for their stern demeanor, surprisingly forgave the orcs. Even after such a massive battle, a whopping 150,000 orcs remained. Rimuru, in his wisdom, decided to welcome them all into the fold. He devised a plan where the lizardmen would share their clean water source and fish, the goblins would provide housing, and Rimuru's village would supply goods to the orcs. In return, the orcs would contribute their labor. This arrangement formed the basis of a newfound alliance among all the races in the Jura forest, resulting in mutually beneficial relationships. The orcs were deeply moved by Rimuru's generosity and swore their unwavering loyalty to him. Traini, the wise dryad, offered her protection and the bounty of the forest to Rimuru. She officially recognized him as the new chancellor of the great forest of Jira, prompting everyone to bow in reverence. And thus, the Jira Forest Alliance was born. The Nimaru, ever the witty one, assured the orc representative that they were all servants of the same master, making them kindred spirits. However, he sternly warned that betrayal of Rimuru would not be forgiven. Rimuru, impressed by Benimaru's words, decided to give the orc representative a name. Geld, and entrusted him with the care of the orc community. This gesture led to Geld's evolution into an orc king. Over the next ten days, Rimuru bestowed names upon all the remaining orcs. He also named the lizardman chieftain, Abaru, who experienced a significant evolution. Meanwhile, Gabaru, who had previously faced treason charges, was spared from a death sentence. Instead, he was exiled and excommunicated from the village. As Gabaru wandered away, he encountered his loyal subordinates who chose to follow him into exile. Meanwhile, Demon Lord Clayman stood over his failure, with Laplace taunting him mercilessly. Three months after the battle, the High Orcs, under Kaijin's guidance, had developed new skills and become a dependable workforce. What was once a village had evolved into a bustling town with well-constructed roads, buildings, and a sewage system. One day, Sawi reported that several hundred Pegasus-mounted knights were heading toward their village. The formidable King Gazel Dwargo had arrived to meet Rimuru in person. King Gazel landed right before Rimuru, and as Gazel began to threaten him, Kaijin hurried to greet the Dwarf King. Rimuru, never one to back down from a challenge, introduced himself and accepted King Gazel's one-on-one -on -one battle challenge. The duel commenced, with Trainee also arriving to witness the spectacle. They decided that Rimuru would win if he could block King Gazel's strike. After a series of intense blows, Rimuru managed to dodge the first strike and successfully blocked the second. The winner was declared, and King Gazel couldn't help but be impressed by Rimuru's sword skills. Rimuru humbly attributed his abilities to his master, Hakuru, who was also the mentor of the Dwarf King. Nightfall brought a grand feast, during which Dwarf King Gazel expressed his desire to establish a mutual relationship treaty with Rimuru's burgeoning nation. Rimuru gladly accepted the proposal but realized that he hadn't thought of a name for his nation yet. Suddenly, inspiration struck, and he christened his nation the Jura Tempest Federation, a name that resonated with everyone present. The goblin town was officially named Rimuru Capital City, and as Rimuru and the Dwarf King shook hands, a new era of cooperation and friendship was sealed. After the treaty was signed between the Dwargo Kingdom and the Jura Tempest Federation, the nation of monsters gained a powerful and influential ally. Just two days later, they received an unexpected gift, Vesta, who was offered by the Dwarf King as a gesture of goodwill. The Dwarf King conveyed to Rimuru that Vesta could be used in any way he saw fit, and even ordered Vesta to immerse himself in studying within the village. Vesta, humbled and remorseful for his past actions, approached Kaijin and Rimuru to request permission to work for their federation. Kaijin, recognizing Vesta's talents, readily accepted and took full responsibility for his guidance. Rimuru, always open to new talent, agreed, and the Dwarf King left, satisfied with the arrangement. In the meantime, Gabaru had also joined the village, and even his sister came to gain valuable experience from their new allies. With the formation of their alliance, Rimuru bestowed names upon Gabaru and his brethren. 
the Lizardmen had evolved into powerful Dragonuts, and Rimuru entrusted Soka and other servants to Sawi's care while assigning Gabaru and his comrades various tasks. As the Lizardmen evolved, some of them began to resemble humans more closely. Rimuru established a laboratory for Vesta in Veldora's cave, where Gabaru and his associates worked as miners. Much had changed in a short span of time. However, a new challenge arose when Lord Millen, a servant of Lord Clayman, expressed her desire to attack Rimuru and the village. Initially, Clayman denied her request due to their non-aggression pact with the Jira Forest. Still, with Veldora's absence, Clayman ultimately agreed to Millen's plan. Lord Millen began preparations for an impending attack. Rimuru suddenly sensed an immense magical presence approaching the village at incredible speed. Lord Millen dramatically landed on a cliff before Rimuru, introducing herself as the one and only Dragonoid, also known as the Destroyer and Demon Lord Lord Millen Nava. She had come to acquaint herself with the strongest entity in the Jura Forest. Lord Millen possessed unique eyes capable of assessing the magicules in anyone. She assured Rimuru that her visit was merely a courtesy call. However, a misunderstanding led to a heated battle as Shin and the others attacked Lord Millum, prompting Ranga to swiftly evacuate Rimuru to safety. Rimuru, with his quick thinking, used a jar of honey to distract Lord Millum. She found it delicious and demanded more, leading to a humorous negotiation where Rimuru proposed that she admit defeat if she wanted more honey. He taunted her playfully, and they eventually called it a draw. Lord Millum vowed not to mess with Rimuru again, and Rimuru rewarded her with a jar of honey. Lord Millum then asked Rimuru about becoming a demon lord but Rimuru declined, as he found enjoyment in his current form as a slime. Lord Millum explained the allure of being a demon lord, but Rimuru insisted that he was content. They agreed to address each other as Rimuru-san and Lord Millum, respectively. Gabaru, not realizing who Lord Millum was, called her a runt, resulting in a powerful punch that sent him flying miles away. Rimuru revealed Lord Millum's true identity as a demon lord to Gabaru, leaving him in shock. Rimuru introduced Lord Millum to the entire village, marking the first time the villagers had seen a demon lord. They were initially apprehensive but soon embraced the idea of such a powerful ally joining their forces. Rimuru took Lord Millum to a hot spring bath, which she thoroughly enjoyed. Rigard and others cautioned Rimuru about the potential complications of having Lord Millum as an influential ally, as it might not sit well with other demon lords. Rimuru agreed that they should do everything possible to keep Lord Millum happy, given her immense strength. Shin and Shuna, in the meantime, enjoyed playing in the water during the hot spring bath, adding a touch of lightheartedness to their eventful day. Fuse and his minister friend engaged in a discussion about Rimuru, who had played a pivotal role in saving the world from the Orc Lord. They contemplated whether Rimuru should be considered an ally or a potential threat. Fuse ultimately decided to meet with Rimuru, accompanied by Aran and Cavill. Meanwhile, Lord Millen was thoroughly enjoying the food in the town. Vesta was hard at work on a communication globe and various experiments. Rimuru decided to show Vesta his remarkable healing potion, purified from specific plants, boasting an impressive 99% efficiency. In contrast, using dwarven techniques, Vesta could only extract 98% pure healing potion. Rimuru's potion was classified as a high potion, and that mere 1% difference made a significant potency improvement. Vesta eagerly shared his breakthrough with Rimuru, who absorbed and analyzed the potion. It turned out to be equivalent to a full potion that Rimuru could create. Kaijin and Gabaru congratulated Vesta. Rimuru suggested selling the high-level healing potion as a source of income for Tempest. Kaijin, however, believed that such potent potions should be reserved for high-level champions in life and death situations. Vesta added that the healing potions typically sold in the Dwarven Kingdom were of lower potency, created by diluting high potions. Vesta proposed that Rimuru negotiate with King Gazel to produce low potions in Tempest City. Kaijin pointed out that if Tempest produced and sold potions, the Dwarven Kingdom would only need to acquire the necessary ingredients, benefiting both nations. As Rimuru and Kaijin exited the cave, they heard a massive explosion in the city. A warrior from the Beast King's Beastketeer's army had attacked and injured Rigard. Lord Millum intervened swiftly, knocking the warrior unconscious. Rimuru arrived to heal Rigard but was confused by Lord Millum's actions. He scolded her for her recklessness, which made her cry. She retaliated by delivering another powerful kick to the unconscious warrior, ready to blow him up entirely before Rimuru intervened. Rimuru began investigating the warrior and his comrades, pressing the warrior for their purpose in Tempest City. The warrior, however, displayed arrogance and disrespect towards Rimuru. Lord Millum silenced him with a menacing gaze, and Rimuru calmed her down. The warrior finally revealed that his lord, Carrion, had ordered them to scout a mysterious magin to serve him. Rimuru instructed the warrior to leave and convey a message to Carrion. If he wanted to talk, he could choose a date and contact them again. The warrior departed with resentment towards Lord Millum. 
Rimuru then inquired about Lord Carrion, promising Lord Milam a new weapon in exchange for information. She explained that a few demon lords, including herself, had manipulated Jalmud in a scheme to create a puppet demon lord. The storm unleashed during her attack would grow in strength, potentially engulfing Rimuru's nation and people. One of the neighboring nations was the Kingdom of Falmouth, with barren lands, western provinces, and eastern plains. Tempest served as a major trade power known as the Gateway to the Western Provinces. A rowdy gang led by a man named Yam roamed the region, drawn together by money. As Yam and his gang traveled, they heard screams and encountered adventurers facing a giant spider monster. Iran and his friend rushed to assist Yam. A colossal night spider appeared, which Yam managed to defeat after some struggle. Yam expected Fuse to pay him for his involvement. Unexpectedly, Gobda appeared out of nowhere, greeting Cavill. Gobda defeated the spider and claimed it as dinner. His actions left Fuse and Yao utterly shocked. They began preparing the spider meal while Lord Milam eagerly waited in line for her portion. Fuse and Yam finally met Rimuru, and Yam started hurling insults at him. Shin, annoyed by Yam's behavior, knocked him unconscious with a swift strike from her sheathed sword. Rimuru healed Yam and expressed his desire for peace. He explained that Tempest had already formed an alliance with the Dwargan Kingdom and aimed to make Tempest more convenient for merchants, a fact confirmed by Vesta. Fuse recognized Vesta and wanted to ensure that Rimuru was an ally to humans. Rimuru asked Yam to take credit for defeating the Orc Lord so that Rimuru could be known as a trustworthy monster who had assisted the champion in the battle. Yam contemplated the idea and, after witnessing the town's prosperity, began to trust Rimuru. He expressed his desire to serve under Rimuru and even contemplated faking his own death to avoid returning to his kingdom. Yaum and his comrades decided to undergo training under Hakuru. Demon Lord Clayman, on the other hand, hired another Majin named Tyr to gather information about Rimuru the Slime. Tyr also informed Clayman about another Demon Lord's attempt to revive Charybdis. This news prompted Clayman to instruct Tyr to locate the sea and find out if they could tame Charybdis. Phobio, the warrior who held a grudge against Milam, was determined to seek revenge for the humiliation he had suffered. However, his desire for revenge wasn't realistic given Milam's immense power. His comrades suggested that instead of seeking revenge, they should consider establishing diplomatic relations with Tempest, as they possessed valuable skills and techniques that beastmen lacked. Despite the advice, Phobio's desire for vengeance persisted. Suddenly, a masked magin named Footman appeared before them, a member of the moderate Harlequin Alliance, also known as Footman the Angry Pirit. Tyr, another powerful individual, also appeared alongside Footman. They explained that they had sensed a wave of hatred and anger which had prompted them to inquire about Phobio's grievances. Phobio's fellow beastmen wanted to drive the Magins away, but Footman enticed Phobio with the prospect of gaining power albeit with some associated risks. They proposed that Phobio tame Charybdis, a formidable monster, and become an equal to a demon lord. However, they laid down certain conditions for this partnership. Phobio decided to send his comrades back to their kingdom and resigned from his position to avoid causing any problems for his lord. Meanwhile, Shen, Shuna, and Milam were competing to see who could hold their breath the longest. Fuse, who had initially believed that Rimuru and Tempest were harmless, chose to stay because he found Tempest comfortable and desired an extended break. He had also laid the groundwork for spreading the word that Yaum and his team were the ones who had defeated the Orc Lord portraying Rimuru and his group as harmless monsters who had merely assisted the champions. Rimuru asked Fuse to help build a road leading to the Kingdom of Belmond, as he intended to sell Tempest's produced goods to other kingdoms. Rimuru also requested that Fuse introduce some advisors to him. Phobio and the Magin were outside the Cave of Charybdis, which had not yet been revived. They convinced Phobio to enter the cave, break the seal, and take Charybdis into his body, merging with it as one being. Unbeknownst to Phobio, he had fallen into their trap, and Tyr and Footman mocked him for being a fool. This was all part of Clayman's plan. Rimuru and Milam were in conversation when they sensed a strong presence. All of the Kijin joined them, and suddenly, Trainee's younger sister, Trya, appeared. Trya warned them about the approaching calamity and the revival of Charybdis. She provided further information, revealing that Charybdis was Veldora's child, a sky monster with no intelligence that summoned shark-like creatures called Megalodons from the spirit world to join its rampage. Charybdis was heading towards Tempest with 13 sharks, and Milam expressed her desire to help. However, Shin and Shuna disagreed with her. Rimuru considered calling King Gazel for backup. After a conference, Rimuru shared his past and the story of Shizu with Fuse. They began formulating plans to confront and battle Charybdis. With an army prepared, Rimuru's forces consisted of orcs, dwarves, dragonclaws, and Kijin. The battle against Charybdis and its accompanying megalodons began. Benimaru managed to take down one of the sharks, but their attacks were proving insufficient to destroy the formidable creatures. This was due to Charybdis's unique skill, magic jamming 
which reduced magic efficiency. Geld and his men, with some assistance from Gabaru, successfully took down another shark after a challenging struggle. Pegasus and Gobder riders utilized a tactic where some would divert the attention of the Megalodons while others attacked. Hakuru served as the strategist for Rimuru's army. Nilam expressed her eagerness to join the battle, but Rimuru refused her offer. Sawa used his strings to manipulate one of the sharks to attack another, while Ranganshin, demonstrating incredible abilities, took down two more sharks. Karibis was the last remaining threat, and despite their best efforts, Ranga and Sawa's attacks didn't seem to work. Karibis began attacking them with its scales, and Sawaianshin struggled to defend against them. Ranga stepped in as a shield to allow Sawaianshin to escape. They continued their attacks, but Karibis displayed a rapid regeneration ability that disappointed Rimuru. It could regenerate all removed scales within three minutes. Rimuru decided they had only three minutes to deal as much damage as possible before the scales regenerated. The Nimuru ordered the monsters to attack Karibdis and prevent its regeneration. With the support of the Pegasus Knights, their combined strength increased tenfold, yet by sunset, Charybdis had only sustained around 30% damage. In a surprising moment, Charybdis muttered Milam's name and showed signs of life within. Rimuru realized that Charybdis had come to Tempest because of Milam. He called Milam and informed her of Phobio's involvement, urging her to engage in battle without killing him. Phobio attacked Charybdis with its scales, but Milam intercepted the scales and launched a massive attack called Dragon Buster, completely destroying Charybdis's body and ejecting Phobio. Rimuru caught Phobio and began healing him. Charybdis's magic ore was removed from Phobio and consumed by Rimuru. The Great Sage isolated it for appraisal. Phobio apologized to Milam for his grave mistake. Trainee and Tri arrived to investigate Phobio's discovery. Phobio revealed information about Footman and Tyr. Gabaru informed Rimuru about Laplace, the president of the moderate Harlequin Alliance, a jack-of-all-trades group. The pieces of the puzzle started coming together. While Milam had no knowledge of such an alliance, she suspected that Clayman was behind the scheme. Phobio took full responsibility for his actions, and both Milam and Rimuru forgave him. Suddenly, Demon Lord Carrion, Phobio's lord, arrived at the scene. Rimuru saw Carrion for the first time. Carrion punched Phobio into the ground but thanked Rimuru for sparing his life. Rimuru proposed a non-aggression pact with the Jira Tempest Federation, which Carrion agreed to. He then took Phobio, who was bleeding, and left the scene. After the battle, Hakuru was busy preparing a feast for everyone. He was chopping up the dead Megalodons to be served for dinner, while the Kijin and Habaru were checking the scales from the Megalodons to create new weapons shields, armor, and accessories that could fetch high prices and trade. The monsters were having a lively celebration, reminiscing about the battle they had just fought. The Jira Forest had become more peaceful after the non-aggression pact. Meanwhile, Rimuru was enjoying a relaxing time with Milam and other girls in a hot bath. Milam felt the need to make sure that other demons stayed away from causing trouble in Tempest. After the feast, the goblins were lying around, satisfied and full. Rimuru had a dream about Shizu, in which she told him to move to the royal capital of the kingdom of Ingracia. This dream led Rimuru to make a decision. He announced to everyone that he would be leaving the village for a while and entrusted them with the responsibility of taking care of it in his absence. Rimuru departed from the village with Ranga, embarking on his first journey to the kingdom of humans in the two years since his reincarnation as a slime. He was on his way to Freedom Academy, which had been established by one of Shizu's students, Yuuki Kagurazaka. Rimuru had sent an introductory letter through Fuse. Three days later, Rimuru arrived in the royal capital of Ingracia, using the ID that Fuse had prepared for him without any issues. The city was massive, with modern architecture, and Rimuru entered the Free Union. There, he met the Grand Master and sought to meet with Yuuki. Upon seeing Shizu's mask on Rimuru's face, Yuuki attacked him. <laughs> Rimuru managed to calm Yuuki down by using words that Yuuki had taught to Shizu. They began to talk about anime, manga, and updates about Tokyo. Yuuki expressed his wish to see those manga with his own eyes, which gave Rimuru an idea. He asked Yuuki for some paper, absorbed it as a slime, and started creating manga for him. Rimuru gave Yuuki a truckload of manga. Rimuru then explained the reason for his journey to the royal capital, and Yuuki initially mistook it for Rimuru planning to return to Japan. Yuuki mentioned the myths of ogres and orcs in Japan and speculated about the possibility of traveling between both worlds under certain conditions. Yuuki arranged for Rimuru to become a school teacher at Freedom Academy, where he would be teaching Shizu's students. Yuuki also asked Rimuru if he knew Hinata Sakaguchi, a student of Shizu. Rimuru remembered Hinata as the one who had left Shizu to walk his own path and had gained strength surpassing Shizu at the age of 15. 
Yuuki shared this information to help Rimuru understand the difference between the otherworlders like Hinata and those who were spontaneously summoned, like themselves. Yuuki further explained the summoning process, the creation of a body when traveling to this world, and the tragic fate of the five other summoned students who had been destroyed. He expressed his desire for Shizu to save those children. As Rimuru entered the classroom to meet his new students, he was immediately attacked by one of them, a student named Ken. Rimuru was introduced to the five summoned students, Kenya Misaki, Ryota Sekahachi, Gail Gibson, Alice Rondo, and Chloe Aubert, whom he would be teaching. Rimuru was determined to gain the trust of his students, and he began by taking attendance. However, none of the five students responded to him. Rimuru decided to use Ranga to scare the students into cooperating with him. He then attempted to start a lesson, but the students protested, explaining that they hadn't studied anything since arriving in this world. They were aware of their impending fate, and their situation had left them hopeless. Rimuru wanted to give them a glimmer of hope and asked the students to try to defeat him within 10 minutes using their chosen weapons. Ken was the first to step forward, but he struggled to land even a single blow. When the time was up, Ken left in tears. Chloe, who could use water magic, was the next to attack. She trapped Rimuru in water and launched water blades at him but they had no effect on him. Gale followed, using magic bullets, which Rimuru easily absorbed. Ryota then applied the body enhancement technique Berserker and attempted to attack Rimuru, but he missed every strike. Lastly, Alice used puppets to fight, but the time ran out before she could make any significant progress. Rimuru pondered a way to save these children from their inevitable fate. He showed them Shizu's mask and told them that Shizu had entrusted their well-being to him. This revelation began to earn the students' trust. Rimuru used a warp portal, a technique taught to him by Vesta, to meet with Trainee and discuss the situation of the children and how to potentially save them. Trainee informed Rimuru about the location of the superior spirit's dwelling, known as the Dwelling of Spirits, but she was unaware of the current queen's identity or whereabouts. Rimuru made a promise to Shizu that he would take care of everything. He continued to work as a teacher for a month while also trying to locate a superior spirit but found no success. Rimuru decided to take the students on a picnic and discuss their training. He offered a manga as a reward for the student who performed the best. As he was about to distribute the manga, high-pressure winds started blowing, and the Great Sage informed Rimuru of the aura emitted by a sky dragon heading towards the capital. Rimuru followed the dragon, which was attacking the army with its force shield and lightning. Rimuru absorbed the dragon and flew away, saving the city. Later, Yuuki informed Rimuru about a merchant named M. Jalmeyer, whom Rimuru had previously saved in his adult Shizu form. M. Jalmeyer invited Rimuru and his students to a dinner. Yuuki assured Rimuru that M. Jalmeyer could be trusted, as he had conducted a background check on him. Rimuru and his students enjoyed a grand feast with M. Jalmeyer, during which M. Jalmeyer revealed that he knew Rimuru's true identity. Rimuru asked M. Jalmeyer to visit Tempest City and help them with trade and commerce, to which M. Jalmeyer agreed. As they were about to leave, Rimuru overheard M. Jalmeyer's servant mentioning the name of the Queen of Spirits. He approached the servant and asked if she knew the location of the Dwelling of Spirits, which she did. In exchange for a generous tip, she revealed that the Dwelling of Spirits was located in the Republic of Olgrasia. Rimuru then began his journey toward the Dwelling of Spirits with his students. Rimuru and the children had reached the entrance of the Dwelling of Spirits, but their path wasn't straightforward. They started hearing laughter in their heads, attempting to scare them off. The labyrinthine path then suddenly lit up, leading them to a dead end. The room transformed into a battlefield, and Rimuru was asked to face a test in the form of a robot. Rimuru instructed Ranga to protect the children while he confronted the robot. The robot was a formidable adversary, made of magisteel and even stronger than the dragon Rimuru had faced in the capital. It launched attacks at Rimuru, causing concern among the children. Rimuru assured them and retaliated with arcane threads and a hell flare attack, which vaporized the robot. Rimuru then threatened to burn the spirit responsible if she didn't reveal herself. A fairy named Ramaris of the Labyrinth appeared before Rimuru, introducing herself as one of the ten great demon lords. Rimuru playfully teased Ramaris, which irked her. Ramaris explained that she had wanted to have fun and then save them dramatically to earn Rimuru's respect. She scolded Rimuru for destroying her creation, the colossal robot, which she had built using spirit engineering. Ramaris revealed that the robot was the same project that Vesta's team had failed to complete. She had successfully finished the research and built it herself. Despite her eccentric behavior, Rimuru acknowledged Ramaris's abilities and asked for her assistance. After explaining their predicament, Rimuru asked Ramaris to introduce them to the Queen of Spirits. However, Ramaris disclosed that she was the queen he was looking for. She explained the reason why a demon lord held the title of Queen of Spirits and told Rimuru about Demon Lord Leon, a former hero who had become a demon lord. Ramaris, as the former Queen of Spirits, had many titles, including Guide to the Saints and Fairy of the Labyrinth. She agreed to help Rimuru with his plan to summon a superior spirit. Ramaris led them to the Dwelling of Spirits, where Rimuru would attempt to summon a superior spirit. 
If he failed, he could use his degenerate skill to create one using the gathered energy. Rimuru and the students were on their way to summon superior spirits. Ramrus led them to a location where they could call forth the spirits by using any word or phrase, such as help or let's play. Gale was the first to attempt the summoning. He began praying, but instead of superior spirits, inferior spirits appeared. Rimuru used his gluttony ability to absorb the tiny spirits and created a superior spirit with the earth attribute. He then transferred this spirit to Gale. Alice was next, and she received a superior spirit with the space attribute. Ken summoned a superior light spirit, and Rimuru transferred the spirit to him. Chloe began her summoning, and a superior spirit appeared. However, this spirit was different and seemed to possess incredible power. It kissed Rimuru and vanished into Chloe. Ramaris explained that the entity resembled a spirit and had come from the future. By inhabiting Chloe, the spirit had laid the foundation for its own rebirth. The students were saved, and they expressed their gratitude to Ramaris. Many other spirits appeared, and the students celebrated their newfound abilities. As promised, Rimuru gave Ramaris a new robot possessed by a demon. Yuki was curious about how Rimuru had created the superior spirits but was silenced when Rimuru gave him a bunch of new manga. Rimuru reminisced about his journey over the past two years, making new friends, battling formidable foes, building alliances with powerful nations, befriending a demon lord, saving the students, and even inhabiting an entire town. Another demon lord observed Rimuru's activities through a magic globe. Rimuru resigned from his position as a teacher, and the students were emotional about his departure. Chloe didn't want him to leave, and Rimuru gave them coats crafted by Shuna as parting gifts. He also gave Chloe Shizu's mask, although he couldn't explain why he chose to give it to her. As Rimuru and Ranga continued their journey back to Tempest City, they were unaware that a mysterious warrior in a white coat was eavesdropping on their conversation from behind a tree. Rimuru looked forward to returning home. In the kingdom of Filtwood, a lady who had lost her husband sought to summon a demon to avenge his death. She was willing to offer anything in exchange for justice and to make the one who killed her husband pay for their actions. This kingdom bordered the forest of Jura, and Shizu received an urgent request to visit the kingdom and deal with a resurrected demon threat. Upon her arrival, Shizu encountered a group of heroes, some of whom were well known, while others were less familiar. The kingdom's minister explained the situation to them, detailing that the demon had been sealed away by a champion named Orthos centuries ago. Two renowned heroes had already perished in attempts to confront the demon. The demon sought to reclaim its body, which was in the possession of the kingdom, to complete its resurrection. Shizu speculated that the demon might be a superior demon, possibly even an archdemon. She questioned the minister about the demon's name, but there were no records of it having one. This lack of a name puzzled Shizu, as it seemed unusual for a demon of such power to be nameless, especially if it had defeated a renowned hero like Silver Wings. The situation grew tense when a man attempted to leave the hall and was swiftly killed by the minister's general, who burned him to death. To everyone's shock, the deceased man turned out to be a lesser demon. The situation escalated, with paranoia and distrust spreading among those present. The demon responsible for stirring up trouble presented itself as an adventurer named Kuro. Shizu confronted him, urging him to introduce himself. Kuro attacked Shizu with flames, but her mask, which possessed the ability of infinite time compression, shielded her from harm. Shizu retaliated with an attack of her own, using inferno flames. Kuro eventually revealed his true form and engaged Shizu in a fierce battle. Despite Kuro's formidable abilities, Shizu ultimately prevailed. He retreated after realizing that Shizu had access to such a powerful item. The following day, Shizu remained contemplative about the demon and the events of the previous day. Lord Leon informed her about demons known as progenitors, but Shizu considered it unlikely that Kiro was one of them. Shizu was summoned by the minister's guard to meet with the minister himself. During their conversation, Shizu grew suspicious as she realized that the guard had not been present during the previous day's events yet spoke knowledgeably about her fighting style. The guard led her to a basement chamber with three thrones, two of which were occupied. To her surprise, the guard revealed himself to be the king, who was none other than the champion Orthos. Orthos admitted that he had never sealed the demon and had used it as bait to lure adventurers to their doom. Orthos praised Shizu's mask and expressed his intent to devour her. He effortlessly overpowered her in their confrontation. However, the demon who had previously fought Shizu intervened, decapitating Orthos and two of the kingdom's ministers. Orthos had underestimated this demon, known as Black Noir, a progenitor renowned for taking revenge. Black Noir had been summoned to avenge Silver Wings, the lady and her husband who were once celebrated heroes. Orthos was the one who had killed Silver Wings. Now, Black Noir sought the mask, and the kingdom believed Shizu had defeated the demon, leading to a case of mistaken identity in the records of the kingdom's events. As Rimuru is taking the junior class, he tells the students that he will be leaving the academy soon to return to his village. 
The students look a bit sad after hearing this, but the two bastards, Alice and Kenya, say that it's good to hear it. Rimuru further tells them that he is around for almost a month, and the finals are also coming, so the students should prepare for it. Suddenly, there's a knock on the door, and it's Tis Sensei. She is the new teacher in the academy, and Rimuru says that he's busy, but Alice, knowing how Rimuru is, just knows he's trying to slip away to take a nap. Then Rimuru takes Ranga and sees the whole kingdom from a hill before teleporting to his home village, Forest Jura Tempest. Rimuru feels the fresh air and says it has been a long time. Then he starts his long life sob story of how he was stabbed and then got reincarnated as a slime with Riss. He made a nation of his own and saved the students of Shizu. Now, he's facing some difficulty with the demon lord Carrion, and luckily, the demon lord himself has asked for a delegation. Rimuru has chosen Benimaru as the leader and Rigor as his assistant. As a man there starts crying and looks like a complete loser. In the temple, Rimuru is taking various forms of vessels that are to be sent with the delegation when Shuna and Shin arrive. They greet Rimuru and offer him a bunch of dresses. He picks the first one, which looks like a hot wife, the second one looks like Elsa from Frozen, and the third one is a badass samurai. The girls love this, but these are not the type. So, Rimuru puts on a casual dress and goes to address the nation. Everyone starts simping over him when he finally shuts the crowd. He tells them that the nation is growing strong, but they are still inexperienced, so the delegation will make them stronger. He tells Benimaru not to look for a fight and come back like a scared little bitch. Everyone bid farewell to the delegation, and the preparation for the other kingdom's delegation starts. Shuna is looking after the cooking, Vesta is the dressing manager, and a bunch of other mess is going on when suddenly, the forest waifu trainee arrives. She tells Rimuru that the delegation from the kingdom is close and they will arrive within three days, but before that, others are coming as well. Rimuru is confused, as two little brats pick some berries when a cute mushroom arrives that suddenly turns into a giant ass monster. A man named Yam comes and eliminates the mushroom in half. He and his buddies had previously defeated the orc lord, and now they spread positivity about the tempest forest. They arrive before the delegation and at night, taking a hot Suna with Rimuru when he tells them about the demon lord's delegation. The three are surprised when Rimuru finally reveals that it is just for some healthy relations. The next day, the party goes to greet the delegation while Rimuru sits under the melons of Shin. The demon's delegation comes on mighty tigers, and the girl introduces herself as Albus, the golden serpent. She is one of Demon Lord's breastfeeders. Suddenly, a cat, or you can say a cocky bastard jumps from the carriage. Her name is Sophia who is looking to get herself kicked. She disrespects Yam, and Rimuru can't withstand it, so he orders him to fight the biatch. But Chin is filled with anger. Moving with the speed of sound, the destruction was beyond anything. Albus orders her toy Grucius to take on Yam, and the two bastards start to fight. Two fights are ongoing between the two kingdoms, and Rimuru is just watching them because he's the jerk who started it all. Safia and Shin keep going to reach their limits. Safia uses her lightning magic but our milky mommy firmly believes in bare knuckle fights. Sophia mocks Shin, to which Shin agrees and prepares her final blow that will destroy everything to the pits of Tartarus, the maximum magic bullet. Everyone tries to stop her, but she isn't listening. Suddenly, Albus turns into a serpent and intervenes. Turns out that it was all just a test to see whether the Tempest Federation is worthy of the Demon Lord's recognition or not. Everyone is happy, and Grucius and Yam also get along, except Chin. Because her being a klutz has turned the energy blast to its limit and can't control it now. Everyone hesitates and tries to take shelter but Rimuru tells her to redirect the blast towards him. Shin throws the mighty blow at Rimuru, and he absorbs it like he is inhaling some white powder from a table. Everyone mess their pants to see such an astonishing power and Albus now knows that the Tempest are surely worthy of their delegation. At night, a great feast is arranged where the guests are served some delicious food in the reception hall and they like it very much. On the other hand, Albus is drinking barrels on barrels of brandy using her thick tail, while Sophia is turned into a cat to drink it. Rimuru asks if Albus is comfortable drinking like this and she says that it's not her secret. But Rimuru is concerned with the amount of barrels that they have drunk. He tells them that the fruit in the forest is scarce so they can't make much of it and only use it for guests. Albus tells him that there are fresh and juicy melons and fruits in the animal kingdom so she will arrange the fruits. Rimuru is happy but the concerned looks of the demons tell him that the two girls want his water. So, they agree to trade fruits and booze but this is something that Rimuru doesn't know much about so he calls the one and only, Kobe. Kobe is a merchant and a shop owner in the Tempest Forest and represents all the merchants with experience in the demon castle so Rimuru hands the trading to him but the little dog is scared to death. However, Rimuru leaves and the three negotiate while the two demons are a little tipsy. After a couple of days, Sophia and all these along with a couple of people left for Eurizania while some were left behind to learn the tips and melons of the Tempest people. The people from Eurizania are simple and good-mannered in that they were shocked to see hot water coming from the tap when all they used was a heating crystal in the faucet. 
Grucius, on the hand, is lazy as his leader Phobio ordered him to be useful to the great Rimuru but all he's doing is playing with his dock. He goes on patrol while Yaum is about to leave when Master Hakaru grabs him to play with his sword. Rimuru visits the academy and he's happy to see that every young lad is working diligently. A couple of days later, Yaum and his buddies depart as well to spread the positive word of the Tempest people. And just after that, the delegation from the Demon Lord's Kingdom comes back. Benimaru tells the team that the Knights of Eurezania are remarkable and they are trained by the Demon Lord himself, but the architecture and the craftsmanship are inferior to Tempest. Hearing this, Rigor's father starts crying like a pathetic loser. However, he further explains that one thing that stands above everything is their agriculture. There is a vast land with abundant resources that they have ever seen. Hearing this, Rimuru's next plan is to send the delegation to learn about the agriculture of Eurozania. After that, Rimuru is approached by Benimaru who asks him if he can place Rigor as the leader of the delegation onwards as he wants to protect the nation. Rimuru agrees and Benimaru also tells him that he picked up a fight with the Demon Lord and lost spectacularly. He's just a sick messed up bastard according to my data. The next day, Rimuru and the squad leave for Dwargan. The party includes Shin, Shuna, Ranga, and a bunch of dwarfs along with a couple of goblins and some special gifts for the king. Rimuru recalls that Shin is even a bigger klutz than Benimura since she somehow destroyed the whole palace room when he told her that he was taking Shuna along with him. Along the way, they meet Gled and reward them with beer before finally reaching the kingdom. There they meet Kaido, another dwarf, who is shocked to see Rimuru as he only knows his slime form. Finally, they enter the throne room to meet King Gazel of Dwargo. But in the meantime we see Clayman spying on Rimuru by blackmailing Mulan. Rimuru and Gazel talk about some business stuff. Rimuru tells him how the dwarfs are doing well in the new kingdom and Vesta is there along with his freaky experiments as well. Suddenly, the happy bastard turns into a serious one, and Gazel asks Rimuru what magic he used to defeat the Charybdis during the war. The magic was so powerful that Rimuru had to tell the truth so he told them that it was the demon Lord Milam. Dorf doesn't believe Rimuru but it's the actual truth. However, Gazel has an eye for fact so she believes Rimuru. Meanwhile, Shuna arrives with the Beer of Tempest. Rimuru tells them that it is a special beer from the kingdom with detoxifying magic. The two men suck the beer and they are amazed to see how tasty it is. Rimuru also chugs a sip when the system removes the alcohol instantly. Rimuru tells them that it is made from a special apple from the animal kingdom which triggers the two men as they consider the demon lord a prideful bastard. They consider him a demon seducer but still, we haven't seen any plot. Rimuru explains that they are just sending delegations right now but Dorf and Gazel are concerned that this pace can make Tempest the biggest trade center. The two men then talk about some kingdom and boring mess when Shin disrupts them and she is high as heck. She is drinking beer like there's no tomorrow and suddenly falls. They are embarrassed to see this but Gazel doesn't mind and the two and takes her to her room. Then, Rimuru addresses the nation like a humble person but it was just a practice and Gazel tells him that it's too short and he's too humble so the people will throw mess at him. Rimuru agrees, as he was dumb as heck at his previous job as well. Since the gang is in Dwargan, they can't miss the elf paradise. At night, the goblin gang and Rimuru sneak into the elf paradise without Shin or Shuna noticing, and inside is pure heaven. Milky elf mamas are everywhere and they are so happy to see Rimuru. The goblins, well they might have some liquid coming from their nose as soon as they are indulged in the beauty of paradise. There, we see the dwarf brothers as well. Gobda shows his feats but he is so happy to see the melons that he falls with blood coming out of every hole. Rimuru offers some beer to the bartender for free to see how much those are worth in the Dwargan Kingdom. The bartender is happy to see a nation filled with different races. Now it's time to head back and all the bastards are tipsy. Rimuru tries to wake up Gobda but the jerk is cold as ice. Suddenly, Shuna arrives from the darkness with a sinister smile. He is scared to death as Gobzo has told her everything because he can't withstand her seductive nature. To guarantee death, Shin arrives as well and now everyone is doomed for eternity. Rimuru can't do anything so he just apologizes and uses his slimy charm to seduce her and the girls agree with the condition that he will eat Shin's dish for one week which is even more brutal than death. After that, the party was set for home. Meanwhile, Yam arrives in town where he meets Isaac, who introduces him to his sister Mulan who is working for Clayman who is a sick mess. Yaum and Mulan then engage in a battle to show how worthy she is and she beat Yaum with ease. Guess he is a thin stick after all. Yaum is impressed by her feats so he agrees to recruit her to their team. The next day, Rimuru goes back to the academy to announce the results of the final exams and he melts down making the lads mess their pants but turns out that all of them passed successfully. This concludes his reign as a teacher but he promises the students that he will show them the manga he promised that will make them happy. It turns out that these young lads are nerds as well just like you. After that, Rimuru goes to Tis Sensei and thanks her for taking good care of the lads. Meanwhile, Yam reaches the Tempest Land along with Mulan. 
Yao introduces her to Shuna and Shen. Some preparations are being made to welcome Rimuru for his return so Shen suggests Mulan take a hot bath with me. Just kidding. Then Yaum takes Mulan and the two explore the city. Yaum shows her the blacksmith shop, the reception hall, and the market but she notices a high amount of potions which makes her think that the nation is a big threat just like Shin's big melons. Yaum then takes her to the training grounds where Hakuru has just finished up Grucius, Gopta, and Gobzo with a bunch of other goblins. Yaum introduces Mulan to Grucius and he thinks that she is just a little sassy girl. He challenges her and agrees to call Yaum his boss if he loses and what can you expect from a pile of doggy mess got dumped in an instant. Seeing this, Gobda comes up with an idea and thinks that they will use the magical girl to take on Hakuru. So, he provokes the old lad and Mulan uses her magic, but he vanishes in an instant and beats the living crap. At night, the beat-up jerks take a bath but Gobda is still determined to defeat the old guy. At the kingdom of Falmouth, the king is anxious as the traders are declining day by day, and they have heard about Yaum, the orc dispatcher who is residing in the Tempest Federation. The priest there, Raheim, tells them that the land of monsters is a potential threat to their god so they will use this excuse to engage in a holy battle. The old guy suggests using the other worlders. The other worlders are also from some other world like Rimuru and they are strong as heck. Shogo is the hothead who thinks that a mere slime is just a waste of time, but he doesn't know that Rimuru can kick his ass with wine. The others are excited to kick some butt as well but the third guy is a sinister douchebag so he can be a problem. The next day, Yum is lying in the lap of Mulan after getting his ass kicked by the bastard master. He jokes around saying that he would love to lay like this every day. But Mulan doesn't like the joke so she tells him to get up but Yam says that it wasn't a joke so stay tuned as we can get some plot soon. She calls Yam stupid. In the town, everyone is preparing for Rimuru's arrival when suddenly one of the lizard guys looks strangely at Mulan. Next up we see the two jerks, Yaum and Grucius, practicing with each other and as soon as Mulan arrives, she is contacted by the demon lord Clayman who tells him that she is a good servant so she just has to do one more job and be with the man of her dreams. Mulan is a simp just like you, so she agrees as her heart is controlled by Clayman. In the castle, news just arrives narrating that some armed knights from the Flammoth Kingdom are heading towards Tempest. In the meantime, the three outworlders from the Flammoth Kingdom arrive in the Tempest and the three cocky arrogant bastards are shocked to see that even monsters are living in better conditions compared to them. They don't like the atmosphere here so they decide to eliminate the wet slime to change the rule. Karara hatches a plan to try to portray Gobzo as a pervert. She touches him and falls, making it look like monsters are monsters. Everyone is concerned. Gobdo arrives and elevates the situation saying that Gobzo only likes Shin with her heaven-shaking curves. Everyone starts laughing but the other worlders don't buy it so the girl lashes a deadly spell but the spell doesn't work. Suddenly, Shuna and Shin arrive at the scene and Karara wets her pants as Shuna scares the mess out of her. The other bastards try to pick up a fight so Shin takes on Shogo and Gobda takes the other jerk. Meanwhile, Mulan is connected with Clayman who tells her that her final job is to cut off the communication of the capital to the outside world. She continues to perform her mission when Grucius arrives and seeing the weird looks on her face, he is concerned that she is being controlled by the demon lord Clayman. So, Mulan reveals her true form and turns into a magin. But to her ill luck, Yam arrives as well and tells her that he loves her so he will protect her. Mulan is moved by such words and Yam don't miss the opportunity to grab her. Grucius doesn't like this grabbing but Mulan sees this opportunity and starts her final objective. She blasts a barrier and the Flammoth Knights from the outside cast a prison field on the Tempest that makes them locked inside. Suddenly, Shin feels her power leaving her body and Shogo is about to knock some sense into her. On the other hand, Rimuru is departing for Tempest. The students start crying, and they don't want their master to leave. So, Rimuru gives them some presents to cheer up the little brats. As Rimuru hops on Ranga and leaves, the students bid him farewell. Ranga and Rimuru travel a couple of miles to teleport back to Tempest when suddenly a girl is noticed. Rimuru and Ranga feel it as well so Ranga goes into Rimuru's shadow. In the meantime, Shui arrives to warn Rimuru, but he can't do much. A barrier is placed between Rimuru and the outside world. Arimuru uses the resistant ability but it allows only a limited use of magic. Then we see the girl approaching Rimuru. In the Tempest Kingdom, Gobda is bruised and slashed by the freaking bastard and when he's about to finish him, Master Hakuru arrives. He saves Gobda but due to the barrier, the moments are slower and he also falls prey to the other worlder. Now, only Shuna and Gobzo left. On the other hand, Shin is getting her ass kicked by Shogo but she is still giving a tough fight with her weak skills. Just at that moment, the knights from the Flammoth Kingdom arrive and in the name of law, they start massacring and eliminating the innocent people turning Tempest into a dungeon. The girl who trapped Rimuru is the captain of the Holy Knights and her name is Hinata. Rimuru remembers her from Master Shizu but the little bitch doesn't buy it and she lashes on Rimuru. 
He tries to sweet talk with her saying that he's Japanese as well but nothing is working as the girl only seeks revenge. So, Rimuru pulls out his sword as well and the two start to fight off each other. Hinata uses a spiritual attack that attacks the spirit of the body instead of physical form and now Rimuru can only take three more attacks like this. They battle each other to death, but now, Arimuru has only one strike to bear that will eliminate him. Hinata is lost in revenge for her master Shizu. Rimuru senses that Hinata is beyond anything. With no hope, Rimuru summons a superior spirit, but he is of no use as the holy girl has the ability to take control of the spirits as well, just like his gluttony power. Suddenly, Rimuru remembers his gluttony power and tells Hinata that Shizu-sensei just wanted him to save Chloe and the other lads. Hinata also uses her final move, the color whatever sword, and pierces through Rimuru just before he uses his gluttony. Rimuru transformed into a specialized combat form, blending traits from different objects and monsters. Hinata launched a series of powerful attacks, including one that almost eliminated Rimuru with disintegration. Rimuru wasn't throwing down with Hinata, he had distractions to whip up a clone and dip out into the shadows. However, he has some serious doubts, thinking he would have taken the L against Hinata's disintegration move even without the barrier. After the fight, Rimuru tried teleporting back to the Tempest Nation but couldn't because of the barrier. They settled for teleporting nearby, where they met some side characters and explained the situation. The Great Sage breaks down the barrier, pinning it as an anti-magic zone. Kinda like Hinata's but not as hardcore. Rimuru dispatches to hunt down who's behind the barrier, while he hunts for whoever's throwing around powerful magic. Switching over to Benimaru, who's determined to find and confront Milan for sabotaging their magic. Yom tries to stop him. Rimuru arrives just in time to intervene and agrees to listen to Milan's side of the story. Milan confesses that she's ready to take responsibility for the damage she caused. Rimuru scratches his head at first, so Milan drags him to check out the aftermath of the attack, where a bunch of goblins get wiped out. Milan's trying to stir up some drama, pushing Rimuru to lay the blame solely on her, but he keeps his cool and opts to gather everyone for a powwow instead. After gathering all the details, Rimuru concludes that the Western Holy Church and the Kingdom of Falmouth were in cahoots from the beginning. Nair adds that the Western Church dislikes monsters, and Falmouth wants to monopolize trade. Rimuru asks Mayer to go to the Kingdom of Blumen and warn them about the Falmouth's impending threat. Just then Milan confesses to serving the Demon Lord. She explains that Clayman's overall goal is to get the Tempest Nation and the Kingdom of Thalamus to go to war with one another. Rimuru decides to postpone Milan's punishment and instead imprisons her for now. Rimuru is then informed by Benimaru that Shin and Gobzo were both eliminated in the fighting while trying to protect the innocent. No more big melons resting on his little jello head. So, the three heroes spill the beans that, despite being far-fetched, there's some fairy tale floating around about bringing the dead back to life. Then they drop the bomb that the Western Holy Church's troops are all posted up around the city, each guarding some magic gizmo. But enough about that, let's circle back to the revival biz, where Aaron starts spinning a yarn about this chick and a dragon. The girl, born of a human dragon union, was raised as a dragon princess. Her companion, a baby dragon, met a tragic end when the king's attempt to control her resulted in its death. Fueled by vengeance, she seeks retribution against the king and his kingdom, channeling her inner John Wick. After she was done slaughtering tens of thousands of innocent people, she transformed into a true demon. When she had transformed, the baby dragon miraculously came back to life. The tiny drawback to that is the dragon had lost its soul in the process so when it came back, it was an evil monster that destroyed everything in its path. So, this dragon dude turns into the chaos dragon. And get this, when the girl ascends to demon lord status, she locks away her old dragon buddy. Rimuru's like, why bother reviving him if he ain't got no soul? Aaron's on a roll, though, explaining that the city's still tight in this barrier. She's guessing this barrier's trapping souls from bouncing. It's like a slim 3% shot that this plan pans out. But hey, Shin's got a rack that could stop traffic, so in anime logic, that's basically a surefire 99% success rate. We also find out the fun fact that Eren is Eren Grimwald and is a princess. Woo. After the talk, we learned from the Great Sage that Rimuru has already acquired the Demon Lord Seed. He had acquired the seed when he defeated the orc disaster in previous moments so now all he has to do is meet the conditions and he can evolve into a true demon lord. The minimum amount of nourishment required to have the seed sprout is around 10,000 human souls. That conveniently segues into Rimuru finding out that the Falmouth forces are marching on the Tempest Nation with 20,000 men. Rimuru comes in and tells Milan that she's gonna have to die and so she gets up and kisses Yom and is prepared to go willingly. Turns out Rimuru is a prankster to everybody because he was never actually planning on eliminating her but on the plus side. It was kind of an elaborate wingman and because Yom did get a kiss, the artificial heart that Clayman gave to Milan to keep her alive was actually a bug. Rimuru pulls a slick move by smashing this thing, letting him peep on her. 
By wrecking it, Rimuru fools Clayman into thinking Milan's kicked the bucket. Sneaky, right. But Rimuru's not done yet. He whips up an artificial ticker and swaps it in for Milan, keeping her ticking and tossing Clayman's rule out the window. When she's asked what's next now that she's off the leash, she tells them she's gonna tie the knot with Rimuru. Rimuru tells everyone, laying out his plan to wipe out all the Falmouth forces heading their way. He's talking about taking down the king and his whole top brass. Once they're six feet under, he's looking for someone to fill the royal shoes. Yom gets the memo that he's the lucky guy in line for the throne. Yep, he's about to be crowned king of Falmouth once Rimuru's done cleaning house. Rimuru lays down the law, declaring he's handling the big guns coming their way, while the rest are tasked with nuking the magic gadgets cooking up those barriers. Shuna and Milan get the gig of slapping up a new barrier once the old ones toast to keep those souls trapped. In the final scenes, everyone's getting ready to play their part, and the plan's locked and loaded. Later on, the big reveal hits, Gabaru, and others, they all hit up their spots as planned, wiping out the enemy grunts and smashing those devices to bits. Meanwhile, Geld, Hakiru, and Rigur are on a mission to crash the party where the three other worlders are chilling. Geld steps up to face off against Shogo, while Hakiru squares up with Kaioya. Now, Kaioya's got this move called the All-Seeing Eye, which lets him clock every move around him at warp speed, thinking he's got the upper hand. But guess what? Hakiro's still on a whole nother level of speed. He blitzes Kaioya, slicing him up real quick, and as Kaioya's taking his final breaths, he's forced to confront all the grim stuff he's done in his life. Talk about a brutal reality check. But anyway, we're gonna hop back over to Geld and Shagu. Geld uses his Wraith abilities, so Shagu is on the back foot and as Geld goes to eliminate him, Hakiro appears. He shows Shagu that he had eliminated Kaioya already and that he's next. Shagu, of course, panics and then tries to run off to find who he eliminates to gain this survivor ability. This does nothing. He gets his ass kicked by Geld and then regenerates all the damage he took so he could get his ass kicked again. After dealing with a fair bit of punishment, Geld decides to proceed with his plan but Ruzen intervenes to stop him. Ruzen prevents the attack and escapes with Shagu using teleportation. They have no choice but to let Ruzen go, as Hekiro reveals he has rigged himself with nuclear strike magic. With all four magical devices around the city destroyed, Shuna and Mulan replace the barrier with their own. Meanwhile, Rimuru prepares to unleash power and ascend as a true demon lord. Shogo and Ruzen confront each other, with Ruzen claiming he will help Shogo but instead destroys his soul. Ruzen then performs a soul swap, taking over Shogo's body and acquiring his powers. In the final scenes, Rimuru goes on a rampage, accumulating eliminates and nearing a 10,000 soul count. As the army's all gathering up, and then bam. The king's freaking out, thinking about what's gonna happen next. Revenge time kicks in, and here comes Benimaru, strolling up in front of the army like, wake your up, before I Chris breezy you. One of the knights spots Benimaru rolling in, then of course, Benimaru's being the annoying person he is, charges in, taking them all out with crazy precision and super speed. In no time, Benimaru efficiently and with much ease gets rid of the entire army and is left standing there alone, surrounded by trees. On the other hand, Gaburu proceeds to take out another army and at the same time the other party members carry out their assigned tasks and successfully get rid of the remaining armies. Somewhere else, Shogo is seen excited to get into a fight. The useless person explains to Kaioya, another useless person, how his hands are itchy. Kaioya then explains to Shogo that he can understand his temperament. That is when a knight notices some enemy movement coming their way and alerts Shogo and Kaioya. They quickly jump down to confront the incoming enemy. Turns out that the enemy is none other than Hakiru, the old loser along with his army. Hakiru and his men easily manage to defeat the knights. There, Shogo decides to finally interfere and show off his skills. Geld then volunteers to fight off Shogo with his big-ass armored suit and their battle begins with Shogo punching right straight through Geld's shield. Meanwhile, Kaioya heads into the forest and bumps into Hakiru, who's been chilling there, waiting. They start hurling some seriously nasty insults at each other, and Kaioya decides to throw the first punch, but Hakiru totally shuts him down. Meanwhile, Geld and Shogo are still duking it out, but Geld's basically invincible, taking no hits at all. Shogo even tries to pull a fast one on Geld, but he ain't falling for it and keeps his guard up like a boss. Shogo then uses all his strength to defeat Geld, but all his attempts are in vain as Geld doesn't even flinch while fighting with Shogo. Geld then uses his rot skill and Shogo begins to get rotten little by little and it appears to not come to a stop. Soon, Hakiru arrives and throws the decapitated head of Kaioya towards him, prompting him to run from there to save his life. Shogo then goes over to Kiara and proceeds to eliminate her to gain her powers and succeeds in doing so. After gaining new powers where he can regenerate himself if needed, Shogo begins to get a bit cocky and, since no one likes cocky people, Geld once again volunteers to deal with Shogo on his own. 
Gel then proceeds to get the better of Shogo in the fight and manages to bring him to the ground, gets on top of him, and punches him repeatedly with no intention of letting him go. Gel then decides to end Shogo's life and continues to swing his machete towards Shogo which is then countered by Raisin who has arrived there all of a sudden. Shogo seems to be relieved to see that Raisin is there to save his life. Raisin then provokes Gel who soon begins to charge towards Raisin but gets stopped by Hakuru. An energy blast occurs and Gled is sent to where he came from so, Raisin's kinda impressed by how Hakuru sniffed out his trap so fast. Hakuru gives him a heads up about facing the wrath of our leader, Great Rimuru, but Raisin really couldn't less. He takes Shogo back home and straight up annihilates his soul. Raisin's got his plan all laid out, and then he busts out this crazy reincarnation move of his. He kicks the bucket in his own body, only to pop up in Shogo's. Next up, King Etamales. Raisin and Fulgen are hauling ass to check on King Etamales, but Raisin can't zap out Falmouth's king thanks to some anti-magic crap in the area. So, Fulgen steps up, saying he'll use his spearhead skill to turn the rest of the soldiers into freaking human shields to get King Etamales the heck out of there. Just as Fulgen's getting ready to roll with his plan, bam, Rimuru puts a bullet in his head. Raisin steps up to confront Rimuru, but before he can even get a word out, Rimuru plugs him too, no questions asked. Rimuru consults with the king and the king proposes formal relations, mentioning that it was the church's fault who declared the kind of Rimuru as their enemies. Moreover, King Animales lies to Rimuru and mentions that he wanted to talk things out with the demonic realm in the first place, but while he is trying to explain all this, Rimuru grows bored and is uninterested in whatever Animales is saying. Rimuru then proceeds to shoot off Etamali's arm. After that, Rimuru acquires a new unique skill and uses it to execute the now surrendering soldiers, leaving only the king and the archbishop alive. Out of nowhere, Rimuru starts feeling totally drained, like he can't keep up his human guys anymore. He's spinning, feeling all woozy, and he knows this is the worst possible time for it. So, quick thinking, Rimuru calls up Rangan and tells him to get him home safe and sound, and to snatch up Etamali's and the archbishop while they're at it, making them prisoners of war. Someone's been playing dead nearby, so Rimuru tells Rangan to sniff out the survivor. Meanwhile, the word of the worlds announces that the harvest festival to level up Rimuru Tempest into a demon lord is kicking off right now. And once the harvest festival's done, everyone riding Rimuru's wave is getting hooked up with some sick loot. Shortly after, Ranga rushingly brings Rimuru to the harvest and she is quickly covered in a cloak. There, Benimaru wishes to himself that once Rimuru turns into a demon lord, he hopes that she won't become a different person and lose all control. Soon, the harvest begins and in no time it gets completed. After the harvest, Rimuru transforms from a slime race to a demon slime race. Moreover, Rimuru is now capable of freely changing his material and spiritual bodies. On top of all these, Rimuru gains new skills such as infinite regeneration, universal detect, lord's ambition, enhanced replication, and universal threat acquisition. The new resistances that Rimuru acquires include natural elemental nullification, ailment nullification, spiritual attack resistance, and holy attack resistance. Most importantly, the great sage receives one of these gifts as well, resulting in the birth of the ultimate skill Raphael. Meanwhile, Raisin tries to fight Diablo and thinks that he can easily take him out or at least go head to head with him. However, the dumb loser has no idea what he is getting himself into since Diablo has plans of toying around with Raisin since he is already aware of the fact that Raisin is nothing but a mere piece of mess in front of him. The fight begins and Raisin does everything in his power to try and at least inflict a scratch on Diablo, but Raisin even fails to do that. Ryzen then begins to mess his pants when Diablo comes closer to him and Ryzen soon passes out. Now that the harvest is wrapped up and Rimuru is waking up the crew, telling them to catch some sleep cause it's gift-giving time. Rimuru then heads over to revive those who bit the dust, but the sage inform that this current body doesn't have enough magic. Then out of nowhere, Diablo rolls in with Ryzen, offering up his two psychics as magical fuel for Rimuru and manages to pull off the resurrection. Benimaru approaches Rimuru and proposes to come up with a password to test whether or not he has retained her reason after becoming a demon lord. Later, Rimuru awakens and questions if the harvest was successful and immediately receives confirmation. It is then shown that Chin has successfully been reborn and has Rimuru in her lap where Rimuru shows his gladness after seeing Shin alive. Shin then announces in front of everyone that the great Rimuru has succeeded in bringing all of them back to life and has not left a soul behind that needs to be resurrected. Soon, Rimuru gets told by Raphael that everyone seems different to her since everyone who was connected to her received gifts after the harvest which caused them to evolve. Soon, as everything gets settled, Benimaru tries to carry on with his plan of pulling out a not-so-funny joke on Rimuru. He mentions how Rimuru's reason still needs to be tested, and since he already guided Rimuru earlier on what to say, Benimaru believes everything will work fine. 
Benimaru then tells Rimuru the phrase, Shin's cooking is in hopes of Rimuru finishing the sentence. Rimuru then quickly turns to seek help from Raphael who claims that she has answers to all the questions. At first, Raphael tells Rimuru that there is nothing he can do or say now that would save him from Shin, but later suggests something to say. Rimuru proceeds to turn the table and shift all the blame towards Benimaru and reveals to Shin how Benimaru advised him to comment how Shin's cooking tastes like our ex's cooking. This deeply angers Shin to an extent, so much so that she is now hooked on filling Benimaru's belly with the food cooked by her. Soon after everyone leaves, Benimaru explains to Rimuru how something drastic happened in the animal kingdom of Eurasania. Later, Milam Nova declares war on the Beastmaster, the demon Lord Carrion, and mentions that the war will begin in one week. Lord Carrion then tells his subordinate to seek the help of Slime to evacuate the citizens and mentions that he will fight alone with Milam and assures that he will emerge victorious. Carrion then asks his three subordinates to stay and protect the city while he is away fighting with Milam. Rimuru gets told about the situation as well and later we see the battle going on between Carrier and Milam. Even though Carrion shows off his beast form, he gets easily defeated when the fight is interrupted by Frey, another demon lord BH. Rimuru then finds out about the involvement of Frey and soon discovers that she started heading toward demon lord Clayman's domain along with Milam. This seems a bit strange to Rimuru as she is now skeptical of what could be the reason for this happening. Later, Rimuru is seen with Ranga who are then soon approached by Diablo. Diablo then gets the worst vibes of being a loser after finding out that Rimuru doesn't even remember him and what he did to help her. Diablo then requests to serve Rimuru which he accepts and soon the process of evolution begins which occupies 10 times more magicules than Rimuru used last time. Rimuru then begins explaining how they are having so many problems, all at the same time. He also gives some tasks for his men to carry out and decides to go visit where Veldora is trapped. As he transforms into a human form he also proceeds to create a body double for him. Rimuru then wakes Veldora up and he occupies Rimuru's body double to use it as a host. That concludes the recap for now, as always if you enjoyed, make sure you are subscribed and if you like me to do the next part very soon, let me know down below.